happy to get started. And our first um, order of business is to approve the minutes of our January 9th meeting. They were relatively short. But I have a motion to approve. Thank you. A second? Second. Um, so motion's been made and seconded to approve the minutes of our February 9th meeting. All those in favor say aye. Aye. <clears throat> So the minutes are approved. Um, our next um, item is fiscal updates. We have Hardy Merrill from uh, Department of Finance and Management who is with us today and we're going to have um, an update on uh, preliminary plans. Oh my goodness, Hardy, you're like miles away. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and you can't no, you papers. can't really. So, sure. no. I'm fine. You want me to go back down there? <laughs> no. I'll, try and, I'll try to sleep loud. Uh, apparently, the, I mean, I, this is uh huh. You see this oh, <laughs> The house does things bigger, I guess. Um, so, good morning, Hardy. So, good morning. I uh, welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for, for welcoming me here this morning, um, and I hope all members of the committee have weathered the storm uh, in personal lives as, uh, as well as can be. So I will um, jump right in, starting with the first item on uh, my agenda, which is the report on fiscal year 23 closeout. And what I was going to do was um, high-level summary of GF. EF and TF general education and transportation fund operating statements. So you should have a document that uh, is a four page document. Um, exhibit A1. Yeah. Exhibit A1. And I'm going to just jump right in, uh, skipping the cover page to page 204, which is the general fund operating statement. And once, if you are all there, I'll start with the. Uh, it wasn't this document. Okay. So I'll I'll start by highlighting the uh, very first line, which is the top line general fund revenue at fiscal year twenty three closeout. That's the two point two two four billion number that you see in the upper right hand corner at the top of the FY twenty three column. Um, so that compares to. Our consensus forecast uh, uh, by by being forty three million dollars higher than the two point one eight one billion forecast that we uh, built the budget on this year. Uh, so certainly uh, uh, continuing the pattern of strong revenue performance exceeding forecasts. Uh, on the next line, uh, the direct applications line of seventy point. For six million is actually you'll see that's down quite a bit, 26 million from the prior year direct app figure, and it's also down uh, quite a bit from the uh, number that was on the GF operating statement prepared by JFO back in May of 90 million for direct applications, and so really the most material. Um, Sort of point to highlight in a review of the operating statement is that uh, that's intentional. There was a unique feature built into uh, uh, Act 78 this year in the C section, um, and um, we it was actually Act 3 and Act 78 that directed the Commissioner of Finance and Management to only transfer to the general fund, those, um, those amounts from uh, the funds referenced in D101, B2, which are AG court order, Secretary of State Services Fund, unclaimed property, and the three DFR funds. We were directed to only transfer what was needed to, to close the fiscal year and not do a complete sweep to the general fund as has been the practice previously and uh, and the reason for that was that amounts in excess of what was needed to close the general fund were to be transferred instead to the cash fund. So that's the unique feature that we see reflected here uh, in the operating statement this year. 
And the, the upshot of all that really is if we skip down to um, the uh, number near the bottom of the page for unallocated operating surplus or deficit, this number, which is uh, 337,449,200, uh, that's not a random number by chance. That exactly equals the figure that is referenced in Act 78, Section C100, which directs the first uh, $337,449,200 to be carried forward to fiscal 24. And that was a number that the FY24 budget is built around in the construct for FY24. So uh, we, uh, we had a fairly straightforward closeout, didn't run into any major problems. Uh, we did have to have some things covered back in the statement of legislative intent in June, which would have complicated things if we hadn't had clarification. But based on you know that process, we. Uh, we're able to execute according to uh, the session law as enacted and come out with exactly the amount needed for next year. And there's, there will be no um, general fund left that is not spoken for, uh, so to speak. So any questions before I move off the general fund operating statement? Committee, any questions? Okay, thank you. We'll keep going then. Okay. Um, I'm uh, seeing none, I'll move on. I'll just add, I guess I didn't speak to the reserves at all. And we did, um, uh, again, uh, you know, bring the budget stabilization reserve up to the statutory maximum with almost $20 million added there. The only other um, reserve change was a technical adjustment um, between the human services caseload reserve and the 2753. It's a really a technical item that I wasn't planning to get into. I can answer any questions and follow up. Uh, I guess if people want to get into that level of detail, you can do it offline. Um, hey, so I'm going to turn now to page three of four, which is the education fund summary. And uh, I will probably uh, be brief here. We really there's not a lot of significant difference since the May Ed Fund outlook was prepared by JFO. Um, the total revenue uh, did come in 1.7 million higher versus the May general fund outlook. So slightly up there. And I guess within the, um, you know, within the revenue items, sales and use tax did end up being down about uh, 5 million versus the May outlook, although the other segments um, made up for that with the, uh, especially the, the other category, but slightly up in purchase and use meals and rooms and lottery as well. Um, within sales and use tax, although it was down 5 million versus uh, the May outlook, at closeout, um, there was one segment of sales and use tax that was up, which is the cannabis revenue, a little over a, a, a million higher than uh, than was previously expected. Um, but at 2.8 million versus the 1.7 we were expecting back in May, it's not a uh, not a tremendous difference, but a million dollars there. So that's um, a summary of the revenue. Um, of course, there's no changes within the appropriation section versus uh, your May preview. I guess the, the only material um, difference between the May outlook and this statement here is if you look all the way down to the bottom line, the current year unreserved unallocated figure of 137 million is 32 million higher than the figure cited in the May uh, in the May outlook. And that is uh, directly attributable to the fact that per Act 78, C112, 32 million, which you can see up in line 24B, was uh, unreserved from the PCBE reserve. So that will be available for deployment in FY24. So that's the Ed Fund outlook. And I'll pause if there are any questions there. Okay. So we'll move on to the T Fund. And, um, you know, really pretty straightforward here. I don't think I have much to say other than that, uh, you know, the revenue is 3.96 million lower than the January forecast. So a little bit off, but that can be uh, 
uh, that was made up by uh, the reversions line to uh, uh, you know revert that uh, that same amount to end in balance while also providing the full five percent stabilization reserve. So that's the uh, that's the T fund. Uh, I guess not not much to see here. And um, if there are no questions, I'll keep moving. I know you've got a packed agenda. Uh, questions on that? Okay. So um, exhibit A2 is um, the unencumbered balance transfers report. And we are uh, typically you know, required to provide this report pursuant to section D 101 B two uh, each year. And this is the final amounts transferred from the funds listed here. Um, I've already, uh, I think, spoken to the construct this year and the fact that we were only transferring to, uh, from these funds to the general fund, the amounts required to close in balance. So that's what happened on the first page of A2. On the second page of A2, we're spelling out the specific amounts that were transferred from those funds uh, to the cash fund, sub -account, the second sub-account of the cash fund. That's the part that's uh, unique and different this year, um, that we're also reporting these transfers. Uh, I think I've already spoken to those and we understand the construct and these are the numbers to the penny. So uh, that's exhibit A2, fairly straightforward. And if there are no uh, questions, I'll keep moving through. I don't see questions. So Okay, so uh, our final uh, report to bring to you today is Exhibit A3, and this is the report required pursuant to Section 7B of Act 81 of 2023, which was a, which is of course the uh, uh, the act that was uh, passed during the special section, and so. Here, we're uh, required to report on the balance appropriated to the Agency of Human Services for the General Assistance Emergency Transition Program. And this is the number there, the 25.395 million, which, uh, which ends up being available, of 23 million of that coming from those um, special fund unobligated balance transfers. And there was already a couple million unallocated in that in that sub account of the cash fund exactly. So that's what um, Secretary Samuelson will have to work with when uh, she takes the podium here. That's that's fortunate. Um, when we did Act 81, the first place we were looking for was actually to do um, an additional contingent appropriation, and so um, we knew that we thought what revenues would be there to support that last contingent appropriation. We had 21.5 in the budget, just to give a refresher here. Um, and so this is um, really good relative to what the obligations are for the flood. So it's nice to know that this sub account can um, uh, provide the adequate funding for Act 81. So thank you. Um, anything else? Yes. Um, Sorry, just a quick question. This is in addition to the money that was appropriated for the general assistance housing and hotel voucher. Uh, if you're referring to that 10 million, 20, the 26 million. million. It was um, a total, because you did 7.5 yes. in the base, right. and the balance uh, 18 was um, right. One four. Five. Yes. It's, so it's, this it, is all in addition. It's in addition to that, Jim, as well, in addition to the C123 section of Act 78, of Act 78, rather. Which was uh, which was ten million, and so this is um, uh, this is in addition to that, and uh, I'll add, uh, you know, without uh, speaking too much on behalf of AHS, but this figure really falls right in the range between low and high of the estimates they were making of what would be required additional to complete to fully execute the executive order and the provisions of Act 81. So we are, you know, it will um, remain to be seen if additional adjustment is required in BAA, but I think it's safe to say sort of the pressure and urgency is off right now. I'll just add there was gonna be an additional uh, 
report required at this meeting by AHS on the status of their closeout and carry forward funds available to fund this purpose. And really based on the way this number came in, uh, that was removed from the agenda because uh, it real, that kind of rushed carry forward process isn't required. And in fact, AHS will be reporting their carry forward balances, which just like all other departments and agencies are due finance and management tomorrow, actually. And we'll be going over those plans the next couple of weeks. And that's really our first step moving towards, you know, BAA development. But uh, no fire, I guess the good news is no fire drill there. And we'll be able to work out uh, any additional needs from, from their carry forward. Uh, but based on this 25.3 million, things are uh, things are in pretty good shape for that emergency need. Oh, um, yes, Representative. Thank you. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to. Um, I, I appreciate that that reference to the AHS closeout. I just want to, I guess, highlight that um, we don't know yet because we haven't seen a full budget of what's needed. Um, whether this 25 million in addition to what we have in the budget is act, is actually sufficient. So um, I just wanted to put that on the record. That's, and uh, that's, a, that's completely appropriate to have on the record. And, and as stated before, I guess the, the good news here is this is cash in the bank now and available, and we'll probably have time to work things out in BAA and not in a fire drill situation, but we'll be able to see how things are going. And this will be a big part of our you know, BAA development. Of course, flood concerns will also probably be a part of that too. Thank you. So we may be, we will be, I'm sure, revisiting this in the BAA process. Uh, other questions? Uh, and thank you, um, Harvey, for uh, your presentation and the documents. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. And so uh, we're going to move on to the Medicaid year-end report, and Nolan Langwell is here to do that from Joint Fiscal. Morning. 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 For the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal. You really are very far away. I know. I'm going to make some comment about Putin. <laughs> so we should um, look at um, B1, is that yes. Um, yes. the correct document for everyone? Yeah, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to sort of highlight some various pieces of this. Um, yes, you should all have the report. Uh, by statute, joint fiscal and administration are required to report on the most recent end year Medicaid and Medicaid related programs to the e-board, which this is not, but this is a preview of what will be given to the uh, e-board. We include caseload, expenditure information, and other information um, that we sort of want to flag for you in the budget. Um, data, this report represents the most current information we have for the end year, fiscal year 23, um, that's provided to us to date. Um, and when new information uh, comes forward, we can update it as it goes forward. But uh, this is I'm really just going to highlight just some of the key points. Um, the impact of the COVID-19 public health emergency continues to reverberate through the healthcare system, and it will probably have effects um, for the years to come. Overall, 23 Medicaid and Medicaid-related expenditures totaled $2.17 billion. This was 2.3%, uh, percent, or $52 million below what we had budgeted in BAA, but yet still 9% increase in spending over fiscal year 22. Global commitment and overall uh, program administration were down, while the state only pharmacy and dish payments were up. Um, particularly with dish, um, the state doubled its dish this year. Normally, dish is 22.7 million. Uh, there's a cap on it, uh, that's, but there's a cap, and this year we went to the cap. Um, the cap is 46.4 million, and this was uh, to help stabilize hospital providers, as was allowed under Act 83 of 22, which was the budget adjustment. Medicaid continuous enrollment. We often refer to this as the um, suspension of redetermination. The feds call it Medicaid continuous enrollment. Um, as you know, this was passed at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, this ended on March 31st. 
as part of the Federal Consolidation Appropriation Act of 2023. Bless you. So the process of redetermining eligibility in Vermont began in April and is expected to take about 12 to 14 months. The non-disabled adult eligibility categories were the ones that were most impacted during this Medicaid period, during this period. Um, Normally, these categories um, experience a turn on and off the program that they just had more people coming on and nobody coming off. So there was a significant increase in those particular. Conversely, though, the number of people that were receiving Vermont premium assistance saw it decreases in the same period. So we anticipate that as this federal policy, they're calling it the unwind, but we anticipate that as this moves forward, we should see a flip flop where we see a more of a leveling out of the non disabled folks but seeing an increase again in, in the, those receiving from our premium assistance. Related to this, as you know, we've been getting a 6.2% additional FMAP um, since 2020. Also part of this Federal Consolidation Appropriation Act, um, this enhanced FMAP has begun to wind down. Um, on April 1st, it decreased from 6.2% to 5%, and then again to 2.5% on July 1. It will decrease again on October 1st to 1.5%, and then at the end of the calendar year, it will cease to exist altogether. Between fiscal year 2020 and 2023, this, in this enhanced FMAP resulted in over $300 million in general fund savings to the state. Looking ahead, some other things I just wanna flag. Um, ARPA provided a, uh, the states with a 10% enhanced match for one year. Um, this was a period of April 21 to March uh, 2022 on home and community-based services. Vermont had $71.8 million in savings in this period. This money can be matched to almost $162 million gross, and it can be spent over a multi-year period on home and community-based services as per a federally approved plan. Under this plan, um, fiscal year 22 budget included a 3% rate increase for several home and community-based services. This will be funded um, over three years. However, in fiscal year 25, um, there, will be need to, there will be a need to backfill these uh, as the rate increases become part of the base. Um, that's estimated to cost about $17 million gross or $7 million state. FFIS has projected a 15.9% increase in clawback beginning in calendar year 24, which could have a general fund pressure of between three and a half and $6.8 million in fiscal year 24, as well as representative based pressure going forward. The IMD phase down, which was part of the new global equipment waiver last year, is estimated to be a, an additional $2.1 million pressure in 24 and a $6.4 million pressure in fiscal year 25. Also, under the guise of continuous enrollment, there's a new uh, provision as part of the same federal consolidation appropriations, uh, which is basically a continuous enrollment for children. Um, it required all states to have a 12-month continuous eligibility policy for all the kids who were on Medicaid and CHIP as of January 1, 2024. This will, this will have some fiscal impact, but it has not yet been determined what that would be. With prescription drugs, every year there tends to be a new drug that comes onto the market that costs a lot of money. And one that AHS has been paying very close attention to. Um, and then finally, the floods. The floods may or may not have an impact. We do not know what the short term or long term effect would be on this, uh, on caseload or expenditures. And we'll, find out, but we'll definitely keep uh, That's the, the highlights of the behavior. A lot of moving pieces there in terms of future um, budgetary impact. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. Can you tell me a little bit more about the clawback? Yes. So clawback was tied to the, to Medicare Part D. And essentially what it was, was it was this, and I'll, and I'll let Senator Kitchell fill in the blanks where I flaw on it, but essentially when they came up with Medicare Part D 15 years ago, whatever, it was uh, supposed to help states, it was new money to states, but 
And so they, the clawback is a way for the federal government to sort of recruit some of the money it costs um, the federal government to provide the service to states. Now, we were already doing, uh, not to, um, uh, we already had a prescription drug program, so it wasn't great for us, but essentially it's the federal government trying to help pay for this program. And it sort of will go on in perpetuity. Still a fairly significant increase, almost 16%. It is, very much so. Yes, in comparison. Nolan, do we have, and it's maybe more appropriate for AHS, but do we have any update on how the determinations are going? Um, I would defer to AHS on that. Um, can I call, can I phone a friend? We know if they're um, actually showing a decrease in total or enrollment, or is it they're all being redetermined uh, as is? I mean, do we? So let me reframe the question to make sure that I understand it. Have we seen a reduction in the, in the right. total enrollment? Not more than expected. There is a dashboard. Um, why don't I send you a link, and that will give you the details and information. I think nationwide the experience is people have just are not returning. They're you know they're being having to go through a redetermination process. They're sent the forms and they're just and it could be their circumstances have changed. They have insurance. I mean, because how long has it been since we've suspended three years? Uh, it's a long period of time in a very dynamic population. So, um, um, other questions. Thank you, Nolan. And this is very good when you have a minute to go through this. Um, it helps. Medicaid is such a big program, actually, um, and so many moving pieces. We have a, a report called the 52 Points of Light. And so we track Medicaid expenditures weekly simply to make sure how things are going. So it's good that we closed out the year on a, a positive note because there was some concerned that that might not be the case. So something that's some good news to go with a whole lot of not so good news. All right, so now we're moving on to um, the state colleges and the sale of radio licenses. And um, we have um, Patricia Turley here, general counsel from Vermont State Colleges. And um, Sophie's out. So who's Chance State College and Catherine Le Oh, we have the whole triumvirate here. Um, and um, so we are um, being asked to um, address a situation that uh, uh, we changed the statute and no longer required legislative approval for the sale, but we are actually being asked to authorize sales that occurred prior to that change in the statutory language. The sales have actually been transacted. And um, so this is um, a, uh, an action on the part of legislature to validate and to, um, to make sort of official that legislative obligation to approve. So that's kind of the context of why we have um, State College is here today, and I don't know who's going to present the background. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so if you want to put yourself on the record and we'll take us here. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, I'm Patty Turley. I'm the general counsel at Vermont State Colleges. And yes, with me is Sophie Zedekny and Catherine Lovacher. Uh, we are here today seeking retroactive approval of the divestment of two campus radio station licenses under the Vermont Telecommunications Act. The VTA was enacted in June of 2007 and repealed last month. Campus radio stations in the Vermont State Colleges system are primarily run by students. Uh, with one exception, the Vermont State Colleges campuses have had difficulty recently holding student interest in traditional broadcasting. Students are more interested in streaming content over the internet. 
Castle 10 was the first campus to experience this decline, and now Lyndon and Johnson have as well. The radio station associated with the Randolph campus is still uh, it holding strong in terms of interest and participation. The declining interest of students made it more difficult to meet FCC requirements, which include regular reports on activity, content, and the like. Following several, several years of compliance challenges and associated expenses, Castleton began considering whether it wanted to continue to hold its license. In 2017, we consulted with our FCC council, who described these campus radio station licenses as having limited value due to the restrictions on non-commercial educational stations. These are not your typical commercial broadcast stations. A broker would be required if we sold the license. In late 2018, Castleton determined the most expedient route was to relinquish the license, to turn it back over to the FCC. Following public meetings of our um, a, a certain committee of our Board of Trustees, as well as then a, the Board of Trustees themselves, uh, the license was returned to the FCC, which also required public postings of that action. So we did not sell the Castleton license, we, we turned it back over to the FCC. More recently, Northern Vermont University made a similar decision and the board initially voted not to renew the FCC licenses for Johnson and Linden. After learning of the decision through FCC filings, we were approached by two different parties with interest in one or both licenses. Accordingly, we did a, um, a slightly late but still effective renewal of those licenses with the FCC and explored their sale or transfer. Vermont Public Radio, now known as Vermont Public, offered $80,000 for the Linden license alone and we entered into a sales agreement. In accordance with the FCC requirements, notice of the sale was published through the FCC public files, including a period of time for public impact statements Another entity, also a Vermont nonprofit, remains interested in the Johnson license, which has a lesser value because it has a, a much smaller transmission area. We were unaware of the law, of the VTA's requirement that we seek legislative approval. Uh, we made these decisions um, using the best information available to us. Uh, we were guided by experienced FCC counsel. FCC counsel uh, work in a federal regulatory so that they were not aware of this law as well. And we seek your approval to cure this uh, deficiency in our actions. And I'm sure you have some questions. Committee, questions? Yes. Um, I do have a question. Um, not so much about the disposition of the licenses or the retroactive curing, because that seems to be relatively straightforward, but in the thinking about the unified campus, I understand that um, originally there were you know, separate radio stations. Um, is there a thought going forward as we transition to streaming about a kind of unified vision for how the university is going to work, or will it wind up being separate streaming operations in the way that we had separate uh, you know, broadcast operations. Um, at this point, the student government associations are really trying to think through all the different student activities and what that will look like. So I would say that's still a work in progress on those things. A lot of, the, uh, obviously all the um, behind the scenes registration systems, all that stuff is in place for the single university. Uh, but the student government associations themselves, the students will be working a lot of those things out, like student fees, student activities. So I would expect that they will be thinking through on that as well. But there will be more opportunities for cross-campus collaboration on, on things like this. Again, if there are students at Castleton, Linden, or Johnson that are interested in participating in a, in a traditional campus radio station, they'll have that opportunity through the Randolph campus. Uh, if you just want to keep yourself in the Oh, this is Sophie Zidatney, Chancellor for the Vermont State College System. Apologies. And then just to make sure I understand where, where we're at now. So only the VTC campus has a broadcast operation. 
So, no, that's not quite correct. Okay. The Johnson license, we renewed the Johnson license because there was interest in one or both, the Lyndon and Johnson, Northern Vermont University. But the plan is so to sell the Johnson. The, the plan is to likely sell the Johnson license. Okay. Yes. And because that statute's not been repealed, that can be done without any action on our part. Okay. So, Representative Wood. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so since these processes needed to be public and since we normally when um, the colleges <laughs> undertake something that they've decided to divest themselves of, we get a lot of comments here in the legislature. Now, I didn't happen to receive any about this. I'm just wondering, during the public comment process, um, were there any public comments regarding the action? I did not look back at the Castleton action that was or three, three or four years ago now, uh, the Linden license, which was required to be posted for that public comment, did not receive public comment. Other questions? Um, so this, um, as you can see, it's an action item. So we need to um, take official um, action. And I guess, uh, I think I'm gonna do that. I think we are about to get a motion. Um, I move to retroactively approve the disposition of WWLR Linden and WIUV Castleton radio licenses previously required by 30 VSA 8063. Second that. Second. All right. So we have a motion made and seconded um, to approve retroactively the sale of the radio licenses um, as presented. Um, Unless there's further discussion, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor? I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Senator Sears. Actually, it's a comment. I, I would, I read the memo from Maria Royale. I'm not sure we have. I don't know the history of the 2023. I missed it, I guess, when, whenever we did that. But I'm not sure we have the authority to approve this. I would really like to have legislative counsel. Um, um, if you look at the um, attachment C from um, legislative counsel from Maria um, Royale, um, uh, the last paragraph, in light of these circumstances, a joint fist committee has the authority to retroactively approve all five contracts and thereby cure um, the procedural um, defects. So, um, I don't, do. I don't understand where we got that power. Um, well, I don't think we have Maria here. Um, is she here? Yeah, oh, Jen's here. Um, uh, we have uh, Jen Carby here from Legislative Council, perhaps. That might help. Uh, are you prepared I just to want to speak to <laughs> uh, But she's not prepared to speak to this opinion that was uh, pre uh, prepared by um, Maria Royal. I don't, if we took away the legislative role in 2023, um, I'm not sure we have the power to retroactively approve all five. That's what I'm trying to understand. I just want to make sure that we're doing something that isn't going to- well, We're exercising yet. the power that we had before we repealed that statute. Well, and also, I don't think we took away our power. We took away the requirement yeah. Right. Yeah. That, that we be notified. But it says um, the legislature or the fiscal committee. Okay. So, All right. Well. So uh, that's we did obviously have Ledge Council take a look at the re request and um, um, what our role would be to cure the um, the error here and. Um, um, so it's a good question because it's kind of a, it's an unusual circumstance. No question about that, Senator Sears. Um, other comments? Otherwise, I was in the midst of, uh, are about to call the roll. Um, and so we are going to have to do this. Um, um, All right. Ready? So we're, unless there's further discussion, I'm going to have the clerk call the roll. Senator Baru. Yes. Senator Cummings? Yes. Representative Harrison? Yes. Representative Lanford? Yes. Representative Shy? Yes. Represent oh, Senator Sears? No. No? I'm sorry, Senator Sears? Oh. 
Okay. Sorry. Senator Westman. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Senator Kitchell. Yes. Madam right, Chair. Yeah, but my question is, can we vote remotely? That's yeah, I don't yeah. think so. Uh, I thought so. Uh, I thought we changed it in the spring. It used to be the House rules, um, and I believe on joint provision. I'm looking for Jen, but I believe that was the resolution for um, three. You could up to joint meetings. You could have up to three people. That counts as a quorum. That counts as a vote. For up to three meetings. Um, through this, uh, the joint, this uh, the joint. Correction, uh, Justice Oversight Committee had to meet remotely because the State House was closed right after the flood. And uh, we had John Bloomer look at that, and it is allowed for uh, remote Did voting that during the veto ARH session. Six. All right. So I think everybody's saying we did actually give ourselves <laughs> the authority to uh, meet uh, to vote remotely. So um, I think with that, then we have a vote of nine nine one, nine, one um, to retroactively approve the sale. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now you can see uh, we've got the next hour. Um, and we're going to be talking about housing update, and this is certainly something that um, we spent a lot of time, Act 81, um, and the Joint Fiscal Committee was given the charge of oversight in terms of how we are um, implementing the transition from our hotel, hotel program that was set up uh, as part of the pandemic. Um, and so I think... Um, uh, we were going to have everyone come up at the same time um, and sort of coordinate their uh, their presentation to us. We have, um, but if we want to do it separately, um, I don't know. There was some discussion about coming as a group, but as you can see on the agenda, we have the first item is the transitioning, and this is from AHS and um, DCF. So. Why don't we start with Secretary Samuelson and Commissioner Oh, oh. Deputy Commissioner Gray. Deputy. Yeah, I was going to say over there, and I have my reading glasses on, and I thought that gentleman was Chris, but it's not. <laughs> so my apologies. Okay, so if you want to introduce yourself through the record, please. Jenny Samuelson, the Secretary for the Agency of Human Services. I have here with me today um, De Deputy Commissioner Miranda Gray and the Director of the Office of Economic Opportunity, Sarah Phillips. So, thank you for having us. I know that we've got a tight agenda with only 20 minutes. Um, we have a lot of data uh, to go through this morning. We're going to try to go through it relatively quickly, and I hope that we can get through it and then take questions. Um, uh, at your discretion, Madam Chair, so that we, we can make sure to meet the time goals. Okay, and we have two uh, documents from you, D and D1, please, in our package. D is the... Oh, D is just to remind us all the language <laughs> that you have the, uh, to help us see how you are doing relative to um, providing this kind of data. So this that's right. Um, so D1 is the document that you've submitted. Correct. Okay, thank you. So we'll walk, we'll walk through the data that you have in front of you um, in D1. Um, as we all may remember, um, the cohort that we are going to be talking about today are those who continue in um, the, ho the 630 um, cohort for the, pan the historic pandemic error housing program. On uh, June 30th, what we saw was a, a population of 1,250 uh, households currently in the program. That that group of households will be um, will be static and will continue. That will be the, the group that we will be using um, and bearing uh, bearing back in mind throughout the, the next few months of where we started um, and where we're going. Um, we, at this point in time, um, now that we've moved forward by a month, we now have 1,025 households currently 
remaining in the program. Um, with 174 households who've transitioned out, and I'll go through in a second uh, where they have transitioned to. Our average nightly rate uh, has come down slightly to $140 per night. Uh, it's important to note that the way that we're going about this are individual negotiations um, with hotels. This is an average. And so what you will see is that as we go through this over time, uh, this will come down slowly again because it's individual negotiations um, with each of the hotels. Just remind me that was it was 146 or, or what was the average before? Yeah, 146. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. So it, it's, it doesn't change too much. It has, it's only come down slightly. So moving forward to look at un and understand the households that we have currently in the program, the next slide that you have um, identifies uh, where in the state um, by district um, that these households are. I will note that over 80% of the households are in five primary areas of the state, including the central Vermont area, Bennington County, the Brattleboro area, Burlington or Chittenden County, and Rutland County. So that's that's uh, just a, that's one under a thousand are in those five areas, um, with it encompassing more than eighty percent. Um, and you will see that trend carry forward uh, as we go through the next few slides. Um, and also, you'll see us focusing a significant amount of resources and efforts there. The next slide represents taking a look at the population uh, based on the household size in. In the, in the current hotel program, uh, the number of bedrooms or units that we need to bring online um, and by what size. I think that this really points out that really what we're looking at is a units, um, a units challenging problem as we try to bring on uh, the number of units. Many of you may remember um, that for many who were in the hotels before, they even had housing vouchers, but there weren't units for them to transition to. The point of this slide though is to really look at what type of units and, and unlike the past, we've often contemplated because most of our housing programs have been um, for families um, and for vulnerable populations. What you see here is the number of uh, the highest percentage of households um, that are in this program really are looking at single bedrooms or single uh, room occupancy type of units. Moving forward, uh, one of the things that we will continue to- uh, Madam Secretary. Um, uh, you've got one bedroom or SRO and then one bedroom. What's uh, what distinguishes um, the, those two columns in terms of? Yeah. So the first column is primarily those that are single person households. And the second may be a couple person household um, that really does need a bedroom. Just wanted to. And the sure. asterisk. Yes. Next to 10. Yep. The asterisk next to 10 is there's a single uh, household in there that will potentially need a larger than a three bedroom. Thank you. Thank you for it. Can I ask one quick yes. question? Yes. Uh, do, do you know how many of, of this 1,250 uh, have vouchers? How many of these people have vouchers? I'm going to have to, uh, Deputy Fisher. Right. I don't know that number off the top of my head, but I can look to see if that is something um, that we have or if we will be able to understand because all housing vouchers don't necessarily come through the state. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, if there's a built-in assumption here that, that the people are in the counties that where they're being housed now in the motel program. It, that's where they would normally live. So I'm looking at Addison County, where I'm from, which only has nine, and I think that's because we don't have very many options available. And I'm thinking that those people may have moved to Chittenden and Rutland counties, and yet we may not be building the amount that we need. So I don't know what you're doing, if you can speak to yeah. how you're dealing with that issue. So the way that we're dealing with that issue is we're, we're beginning to ask folks the, in, the, in their eligibility determination where they would like to go back to. Um, that that is not fully built in uh, here, yeah. but this this is really an opportunity for us to have a rough idea of where the units are and how many individuals we need. That said, um, I want to I want to make sure that we're all there are some individuals who have moved out of their county, but it's not the vast majority, and that's why we wanted to present this as a rough idea. Um, uh, but the vast majority were able to stay in the communities where they're from. 
So it's a great question. Thank you. Senator Westman. So how many of these, because in my county, the, um, the units that were available June 30th are gone. So how many of these are affected by the flood? Because, for example, um, um, the motels that were housing people before aren't there anymore. So um, I can pull up the and I can pull up the information on the on the hotels. There were a small number of hotels that were impacted um, by the floods. We're currently looking at and assessing um, what that means uh, for um, the populations, and that work is is ongoing. Um, at some point, um, when we get through this presentation, I want to hear where we're going with that population, because um, we ended up with a fair number of people in shelters mm -hmm. and, um, um, yeah. and where they've been rehoused. Yeah. Or, um, where are they been, well, and the other problem is that um, there isn't the housing for them. And um, what we, as we've tried to get them, um, people to work with through Capstone, um, the caseload at Capstone is so great that, um, you know, before this started, there was over 70 um, households that they were helping for. And now some of the counselors are pushing 90 to 100. So um, uh, for me, there's a piece of crisis that goes well beyond all of this. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. The, I want to make sure that we all understand that the, the flood has a significant impact, particularly in the central Vermont region, um, on the housing units that we have. And I can walk through a little bit of what we're doing on that. But we're going to be dealing with floods a little later. Exactly. And that's what I was going to point out. There were 30, uh, what, what Senator Richmond is speaking to, Westman is speaking to, is that there were 32 individuals who were in the hotels um, who had to temporarily leave. Um, some of them have been able to return to their current hotels, but Miranda. Yeah, um, for the record, Miranda Gray, Deputy Commissioner for the Economic Services Division. We did have four motels that had received damage and we have been able to, um, one of the hotels people didn't need to leave, um, but the other three, we were able to rehouse those individuals at different motels. Thank you. Other questions? Otherwise we'll keep going. Um, I, I just want to say this is a really wonderful presentation of, of the data. Uh, very easy to read, not a lot of narrative. Um, so I uh, just want to acknowledge the work because when we first started out, we were uh, sort of a blank slate in terms of the data, the profile, um, the need. So this is, I just um, uh, feel that this is a very succinct and easy way of getting information to us. Just quickly, it's, it's good to see the trend starting to reverse itself. However, do we know, um, you know, when you go from 1250 to, you know, just a thousand, do we know what happened to those people? Did they actually succeed in finding uh, housing? That's, 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 a, that's a couple slides up. Yeah. So I think as, as we go through, the, I think some of the questions, <laughs> but I'm glad we're listening very closely. I appreciate that. There are a couple slides up that I think will answer some of our questions. So if we go through some of the data that will allow us to then, then get to um, questions I think are going to be comprehensive. I just want to add, this is, I mean, I appreciate that the folks who are in this particular cohort are moving into new housing. I don't know if I would characterize it as the trend is reversing itself. Um, given that we still have a lot more people coming into homelessness um, and some of them staying in the motel, some of them not under different eligibility criteria. So I'm very happy for the work that's happening here. And I know that you're doing a lot of other work and a lot of other people are experiencing hardship that are not on this PowerPoint. Right, yeah, and I, I, wanna, I wanna acknowledge that. And, and what you will see is the last, the last slide, which is in the appendix, will help to highlight and identify um, that this is only one small cohort of those individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Okay, so moving moving forward, but directly going back to this, uh, to those who are currently in the program, the next slide outlines the eligibility criteria um, by age, uh, disability, um, and uh, domestic violence, families with children, 
health code violations, natural disasters, and pregnancies that are in this po cohort. And I want to acknowledge that's not the, the, the whole population of those experiencing homelessness at this point. Um, I will say that a lot of, we get a lot of questions around the disability category. That is a broad range um, from individuals who are experiencing mental health, chronic, illness, uh, chronic conditions, physical disabilities. And within each of those categories, it's a broad range of ability. Um, so it's, it's, worth, it's worth pointing out that that is a pretty diverse um, category of individuals. Moving forward to get um, to, to your um, question. I have a question on this, yeah. two questions on this slide. Just want to clarify that we're, some people are double counted for good reason here. Double. So, like someone might be um, have a family and have SSI. For yeah. Yeah. So, in, so they're, they're going to fall under the SSI category first. They're not double. They're not a double counted. They're not double counted at all. No, it's still the 1025. Okay. Yeah. So, so they are not double counted. So in this case, they are falling under the SSI, SSDI category first, and then under the other category. And is it in the order that you would pick to put someone in? It's however, um, I would say is the easiest for the individual to be able to determine that they have eligibility for the program. So disability, because it is based on receipt of Social Security, is very easy for us um, to be able to determine that for the individual. Whereas something, you know, same with having children, that's a fairly simple thing. But an eviction is harder. There's paperwork that you need to be able to obtain from your past to be able to share with economic services. That, okay. Um, and then that I understand that if you divide this by county, we would find that the number so small, probably you shouldn't be sharing it with us. Are you, um, do you see a real range from county to county and how these numbers shake out? I remember at some point we had sort of a supposition, I don't even know if I'd call it an assumption, that some regions might have much higher um, folks with disability levels or much higher families with children. We do have that, and I think, uh, Yes, I want to say that we, we do have that based upon if you looked at the previous where we have our districts, mm -hmm. um, that slide. Yeah. Yes, you would see the range. Is of the mix the, different though? Of the, the prevalence of the difference of, of eligibility criteria by district? Yeah, I don't think so. We can, we can, yeah, it, it doesn't, it doesn't tend to change or shift significantly. I think where you might be able to um, conceptualize that is in the units. Um, data, um, and you don't see a vast variety of different issues. Okay. We're going to keep going very quickly. Yep. We're, we've got a very succinct yeah. amount of time. We've got a lot more slides, uh, and more slides, and we've got minutes, so yes. let's keep going. So next slide gives you the, the reasons for exiting the program. Um, some of them have transitioned to apartments, 34. Um, they've ex exited uh, related to misconduct. Um, they've been housed in a something other than an, an apartment, like a family member or other um, housing opportunity. We've had a, a small number move out of state. And then uh, we get a lot of questions about non-renewal. Not every month, every 28 days, an individual needs to renew. Um, in that case, there's a significant amount of outreach that economic services does by phone, um, in person often, and also um, uh, by uh, correspondence by mail. Um, and these are the individuals who ESD has not been able to, to, to make contact with. You may see that number go down because as individuals lose their benefits, that sometimes entices them to reach out to the state. Um, and so we are doing everything we can to make sure that they're not, they don't lose eligibility just because they didn't contact us. Sure. Yes. Um, if I could just quickly ask about misconduct. That was one area where people showed concern when we had our Senate debate. Um, it's a relatively modest number, yes. but the, the worry was that misconduct would be defined by motel owners without uh, checks on their ability to exit people. Any thoughts on how that's going? It's going relatively well, and the next submission of the emergency rule will have that laid out in, in, more, in more detail. Mm -hmm. okay. and then, Okay, 
Moving on, uh, for as folks may remember, um, the Agency of Human Services began screening individuals uh, for their risks and needs um, back in November. It's not the same cohort. It's a constantly evolving cohort. We are now digging in with this cohort um, specifically. I do want to note that, the, this, that this will give us information on the types of supports they need, but really it is a unit that they need more than, it, than anything else. It is not... Um, and it's that type of the, the types of supports will assist us in, in both helping them find a unit that is appropriate and in helping them keep a unit. But it really is a, it, it is, is a unit issue. And again, you see this, um, this we've got about 755 individuals and households screened um, and about 437 have moved forward. Um, we are shoring up the Agency of Human Services resources here. Um, we have uh, Rescue Inc. who just began going out so that we can rapidly increase uh, the screening now that we have a discrete population that's not ever evolving. I wanted to watch your comment. Obviously it's housing, but we know with many populations and with such a percentage of people with disabilities here, SSI or Social Security, um, it's housing combined. And uh, we have the report from the HCB that is talking about um, the resources that are necessary to support and preserve the housing once it's secured. So yes, you've got to have the unit, but you've also got to have yes. um, the services there so that um, you're not ending up with uh, future evictions or the people that have um, fairly complex needs get the support they need. So um, I, um, I Absolutely. interplay is so essential that um, with the housing first experience that we've had, yeah, we absolutely agree. And that's why programs like Pathways and other programs that really combine services and housing together um, are essential. Many of those programs are having a hard time expanding their reach because of the lack of actual units. Okay, moving, moving. I have a forward. question. Yes, Senator Sears. Uh, um, I, I'm trying to understand what that means. Households with a shared care plan, you screened 119 in the Barry and 109 of them have a shared health plan, so only nine of them don't. However, in Bennington, you screen 96 households, only 50 of them have a screen shared plan. And it goes on similarly in the, the other three major districts, Burlington, uh, Rutland, and Brattleboro. Why are those so much lower than Barry? Is it a lack of staff? Is it a lack of what what is the reason for that? So I think in, in a, we'll uh, look to the team, but you see in some of these areas have been a lot more churn um, in the in the population. We do see a st some staffing um, related issues. It's a process, though. It's a matter of ensuring that we're going in. We screen individuals. And then they meet on an ongoing basis with it with a care manager, um, and it takes some time to get to the from the screening phase to the phase of having um, a shared care plan. And again, in some areas, it's churn where we've seen a lot more folks coming in and out of the program, and that means we've started plans, moved folks on. In other areas, we may have had less staff. Um, and in some areas, it's also engagement of the client. This really has to be um, a client focus. So we can dig into specific areas, Senator Sears, uh, with you. Uh, but those are the those are some of the interplays that we see um, for getting to from screening to shared care plans. Well, we'll be it would be helpful. It would be helpful to me and perhaps others who represent some of those areas to hear more detail at a later date. We're going to be getting monthly reports so we can really yeah, um, see I'd that like trend. I'd like more about why the disparity, though. This, this tells me the number with a shared care plan, which seems good, but I don't understand why there's only 10 of the households screened in Barry that don't have a shared plan, plan and 46 don't have a shared plan in Bennington. I don't understand that. Same with, in, and it's even worse in Rutland and Burlington in terms of percentage without a shared plan. So maybe we could just get a follow up. Yeah, we'll get a, we'll get a follow up summary um, to you on that. And focusing on those um, areas where that disparity is so, um, so significant. Other comments, Senator Sears? Oh, that's it, thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. So we're going to have to move along pretty quickly here. So I, I think we've actually touched on the next slide in our conversation that we've had. So we'll keep moving on um, to the data. One of the elements that, that uh, the legislature was really interested in is understanding for the small proportion of, of the clients who need residential care, what's the capacity in the residential care system? You see that outlined in slide number nine. Um, in addition to that, we are working um, with, uh, with the Vermont Healthcare Association to survey long care, um, long term care residential care facilities and to assess the availability and barriers for their expansion for the needed population. That report will be uh, back to us in September and so we can bring that sub subsequently forward. Move, moving on, there was a uh, there were questions about the security deposits, and I'll remind uh, remind the committee that uh, between September, uh, sorry, summer of 2022 and March of 2023, the program fundamentally changed when we used ERAP resources to a more rental uh, rental relationship. And so during that time period, individuals who came into the program had a direct lease type relationship with the hotels and the state paid security deposits. Um, this will be a one time report out because this information will not change. Um, but you see the total number of people and the funds that they that went out if they stayed in the program less than four months, the state reclaimed um, those security deposits when they left the program. And then the rest of the security deposits were paid out in a relationship between the hotel and the individuals in March of 2023. Yes, um, I noticed I didn't see in slide nine, um, there's residential capacity for sort of specialized um, services, but I didn't see the total number of beds available for just regular emergency housing anywhere. Is that later in the presentation? For emergency shelter beds? Mm -hmm. um, no, it's not. And I can follow up with the exact number. Thanks. Um, and I know that changes every day. Okay. Um, I, I know we're pressed for time, but on security deposits, at the very bottom, it says all deposits should have been returned to clients with no room damages. The state does not have data on what was returned versus held. So that 5 million number there should have been returned, but we don't have any idea about how much was. It was a it, how much was returned to the clients. It was a relationship between the clients and the hotels. Understood, but it was state money. It was state money. We do not. We do not have any information on the amount of that that was um, was returned. We do know that the attorney general's office and others, uh, attorney general's office in Vermont Legal Aid, have been working with clients who feel like they did not receive their security deposits back, um, and or hotels who may not have administered it, the program appropriately. I'm, I'm just wondering why why can't the state uh, require that the motel owners report that data? The state gave the security deposit. Correct. Um, I think at this point it would be asking motels to go back to determine um, and don't know that they would be able probably to getting into a legal um, yes. question. Why do we put that? And we'll, on follow, we'll follow up. List, um, in terms of, um, and I, I, I think we were using ERAP, so this we, would be for federal. We were using ERAP. These were federal dollars administered under the they may administration. Beneficiary, not. So I don't know, but this is something legally, I think we'll have to. I don't, and I, Doug, do you have any comment? I can go now. Yep. Um, Douglas Farnham, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Administration. So yes, the, the ERAP program, those nine months while it was operating in that manner, the state didn't have a formal role, a legal role in the relationship between the renter so we were paying the security deposit on behalf of the renter, but that didn't give us any legal rights to impose any conditions. The feds actually said you cannot impose additional conditions on landlords uh, beyond some eviction prevention measures that they allowed in a year. So the state had very limited um, capability because of the federal restrictions on the program. Yeah, we cannot require, we could not, we could not legally require the hotels uh, to report it back. I, I just want to note the craziness of pouring millions of dollars into a program, but neither the feds nor the state having any reporting on how that yeah. gets ultimately disappeared. Yeah. 
I, I can understand your being confounded by the federal regulations and policies. So, um, but again, we did look into this several times um, and we were not able to legally require the hotels to report this back. So the rest is, um, let's go through it very quickly. And then I'm gonna have to shrink probably VHCB a little bit, but obviously the whole, a lot of the oversight is directed toward the agency. So we'll, um, yeah. if we can uh, finish up in five minutes. And yeah, then we can I, and we can take even less. That we, we have received a lot of questions related to how we engage communities and are resourcing the program. We don't have to go through the rest of the slides. It can be there for your, um, and we can take questions offline. Um, I did, there are two key things that the, that the agency did. One is we submitted an RFP asking for emergency shelter um, staff and services that was issued in May, returned in, in June. Um, you will note from the timeline that uh, that was prior to the, the period in which we created this transition period for uh, the current program um, until April of next year. So what we're using that RFP to do is to staff the screening and case management to shore up um, the AHS staff that are currently doing that. Um, and then in addition to that, filling gaps in the community shelters. Um, the rest of the slides, which again, we can, uh, are really there because we've gotten questions about it, um, are around the, uh, the process where we submitted letters of intent. I want to I want to note that when we did the letters of intent, we requested the letters of intent from communities. There were many other things that we continued to do in terms of engaging um, with our providers um, through the Office of Economic Opportunity, um, through our usual um, processes in state government, um, and those continued to go. This was a supplemental uh, activity where we knew at that moment that we were going to have a major transition that was going to impact communities. And we wanted to engage communities and providers in helping to identify solutions, knowing that each community was very different. We uh, received letters of request of more than 50 of them from across the state. There was a vast range of, uh, from vast range from people expressing an interest in just, in just assisting to really solid proposals. Uh, because it wasn't an RFP, it really was a way to generate ideas. Some of those were really viable and projects that have moved forward to, through the HOP program and others were just communities expressing support. Um, we can provide more information on those at a, at a later period of time, but you've got some of the general information there. The other thing that you'll notice in the slides is we've received questions about whether the HOP grants went out this year. They absolutely did, they went out on time, and they included many of the items that communities put forward. So I'm gonna pause there. I know that we're out of time um, for today, but we're happy to bring back more information on the letters of opportunity in the future. Yeah. Um, thank you for all of this and um, yeah. as the chair said this is like very comprehensive and helpful and clear to read and I appreciate all of that I noticed that um, there are two things we asked for in the legislation um, around sort of an outlook into the future and um, a projected timeline for the transitioning households I know we're early in this project and I know that the more we do for planning now the you know better off households will be as we move along. So I'm wondering about your plans for offering that to us next time. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, what I will say is two things. It's early in the process and the flood has significantly impacted. And I know that um, the agency and administration will go through that and significantly impacted those plans. It would have, so we will be, we will continue to work on that and bring it for, forward at a future meeting. Yep. Other comments or questions? Um, thank you. Um, and we look forward to the next report, which would be monthly. So we can see how the trends are. And really, we have two things. We have this fixed population here, and then we've got the other populations that are homelessness and um, have shelter needs. So um, it's helpful to look at that Larry last chart to see that the other population right now, at least in the program, is quite small. Yeah. Um, so. Is that good news, Representative Wood? Yes. For my perspective, <laughs> I would think so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, uh, BHCB, and we have Paula Major here. Um, 
speak. And um, uh, Jesse Lake was not available, so uh, he has asked Polly to give us the update um, on behalf of VHCB. So welcome, Polly. Good morning. For the record, Polly Major, I'm the Director of Policy for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And we submitted to this committee a report of the board's activities over the last month to uh, operationalize the requirements that are in Act uh, 81. I know we have, are limited for time, so I'm going to I don't need to let most of this stand in the report that we submitted but did want to highlight some uh, sections of that report for uh, discussion with the committee or questions. The Act, One, Act 81 asks us to provide monthly reports on the status of our initiatives to bring more units online and also uh, shelter beds online. And we're, while we're providing monthly numbers on those, I want to make sure that they're being read within the broader context of what Vermont is able to do in terms of bringing new affordable units online, which is going to be significant over the next three years. So since 2020, did you say three or 30? Three. And hopefully 30 as well. Great. I'm just glad you said three. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure on there. So. Sorry, continue. But since 2020, uh, the HCB has helped support the creation or funded the creation of 1,500 units. Those are units that will be coming on board over the next three years. So um, in this coming year, we're going to see about 45% of those online. But by the end of 2026, we'll see all of those units online and we'll have more in the pipeline by that point. So while each month we're not seeing um, the, the magnitude of new units that we'd like to see, I do want to make sure that those monthly numbers are put in context of the ongoing work that is happening. Another point with the data that we provided is that uh, construction timelines, as we've seen over the past few years, are hard to predict. And so there is going to be some fluctuation in the projections that we've provided to you, especially projects that are further out. They may encounter delays and likely will, as, uh, especially as the impact of the flooding diverts resources to other construction projects. So there's going to be some fluctuation and also in the, as we provide monthly reports on the units that we anticipate came online during that month, those numbers aren't rec reconciled until the following month. So we're going to see some uh, change there as well. But we'll try to be as, as accurate as possible, given all these variables. With the, uh, you also have asked us to report on the number of shelter beds that are coming online and have also asked VHCB to invest 10 million uh, in FY24 funds in bringing additional shelter beds in line and investing into the shelter system. And as we've worked more with shelters across the state uh, over the last several years, we've seen that a lot of their focus, rightly so, is and specialty is in that service provision part of their work. And often they need support on the development and uh, building side of these projects. So one thing we've done to help strengthen this pipeline is uh, work with Evernorth, Vermont's housing syndicator, to help provide some of that professional development assistance uh, to shelters that are bringing projects forward to help move them along and, and bring them to fruition. So we'll continue to learn how to support these projects, and we work very closely with OEO um, to bring new shelter projects in line. But that's just one thing that we're doing to try to increase shelter beds. Uh, yes. Um, when you're looking at how to leverage both funding and that technical assistance, do you look at the data coming from AHS about where the greatest need is? We work closely with AHS on these projects, asking them uh, to suggest shelter providers that want to develop have the ability to bring a new project. So yes, I think they're looking at that data and they're bringing um, those suggestions to us. And we're meeting weekly at this point to help collaborate on this. I think I'm worried, I'm wondering about the edge between um, providers being ready, interested, having capacity to think um, about the next step 
and where the greatest need is. Um, and I think we often tend to sort of give money and resources to those who ask for it or are ready for it um, rather than perhaps where the greatest need is. Yeah. And so I think those are two different things that I'd love us to pay attention to in the future. That's something that we are certainly very aware of and trying to balance deploying the resources as quickly as possible uh, to, to bring beds online and also taking the time to develop projects in areas that have less of that development capacity. So very aware. Oh, thank you. I just I just want to sort of highlight Representative Kornheiser's comment and then ask one of my own. Um, you know, looking in your in your list of projects, um, Rutland is a very high need area and very low project um, you know area coming on on board. So just highlighting what Representative Kornheiser had said in terms of areas of need. My other my my real question was about um, on page two of your um, report. You um, uh, addressed the ten million dollars um, around the manufactured home and home um, uh, infill. And my um, my question really is about in uh, the second paragraph where you talked about two partners have already signaled their intent to seek funding to replace approximately twenty five homes. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I'm, I'm trying to figure out is that like upgrading current individuals or is that uh, I, I could you just elaborate on that sure and i think that uh might be a little bit of uh, a misnomer in the writing i think that uh, as we talk to our partners who operate of the nonprofit development partners who operate parks um, they have either had vacant lots that they can put a unit on, or they have a lot that is un unutilized because the home on it is so deteriorated that it needs to be replaced in order to be habitable. Uh, and so often that is the case where we see both vacant and underutilized lots. Those underutilized lots are the ones that have an uninhabitable home on them. And that's what's being replaced in the not with, with, with nobody living in it right now, I'm presuming. Okay, all right, that answers that question. And I was glad to see uh, in Lamoille County the uh, lawsuit being settled on the shelter. So, yes, that's we're very glad to see this forward. Thank you. Um, one of the things that you have in here, and uh, I, I don't know what you have for discussions going on, um, but um, that has to do with. Um, uh, the feeling that with the increased population of uh, uh, renters that are, have exited homelessness, that uh, the local housing entities really um, are struggling with the demands, staff demands, um, to work with those households so that they can preserve. Now, obviously, some individuals are coming, they're part of Housing First or their SASH or whatever, um, but you had, there's a request um, for um, housing, um, I can't remember the title exactly, um, um, it, that would be um, to address the fact that you have such an increased percentage of, of renters that need to have support and um, to avoid eviction or um, if, in fact, you have to undertake eviction proceedings, the um, staff resources that takes. So have you had discussions with um, with the Agency of Human Services around um, uh, that particular area of staffing resources? So we're just starting to have those discussions. And, and could you tell me the position again? So I believe we termed it a housing retention specialist, okay. but as we speak with our partners across the state, they, there's some variation in what they're looking for there. So it's kind of a... Um, a blanket request, but the kind of context for this is uh, Act 81 asks the HCB fund projects to increase the percentage of units set aside for households exiting homelessness from 15 to 30 percent in FY24. And as we look at that and interpret that language, if that was uh, if that were to be applied to new funded projects, it wouldn't be able to help in this effort to transition people out of the hotels because those funded projects won't, uh, those units won't be online for the next several years. And furthermore, the new units coming online this year are bound by pre-existing legal agreements. So what we're hoping to do and asking this committee is to interpret this as, uh, as a, a goal asking our partners to have 30% of new units and units at turnover rented to people exiting homelessness, which is actually a greater number 
because um, that's pulling into this effort the whole affordable housing portfolio of the state. And as we've talked to our partners, asking them, is this something that they're able to do? The feedback we've uh, received is that over the last several years, they've for the most part, doubled the number of units uh, in their portfolios that they're renting to people exiting homelessness. And with that, they've seen considerable service strain on their maintenance staff, on their service partners. And they've also seen an increase in evictions. And for them who have a mission of providing affordable housing, eviction is a failure for these organizations. It's also a failure for these families, and it's something we want to avoid. So in order to successfully rehouse population uh, households exiting homelessness there needs to be those services available and so our partners are saying yes we want to work towards this goal of 30 percent in order to make sure it's successful we need to make sure we have service coordinators resident service coordinators that will ensure that the tenants can access the services they need and so we're asking we've asked them what what would that look like and so far in each of our conversations, they've said, yes, if we had one FDE at each of these nine regional organizations, that could help deepen the ties of the service community and help work with these tenants to ensure that they're successfully housed. So we've just started those conversations within the housing recovery working group that includes AHS um, and we'll uh, continue to have that. I think our hope over the next month was to really drill down on what those positions would look like and what that ask would be in terms of funding. I know we also are looking at philanthropic sources that we can bring in and help supplement that, but it would need some state support in order to really be successful. Other questions? Otherwise, I'm Okay, we have 50 minutes left according to the clock here. Other questions or other part? Uh, thank you. This is really a very um, helpful response um, that has started. And I think we'll be looking, obviously, a number of things I know are out there, potential projects that can be added, I would hope, over time um, that have been worked on. Can um, I just, yes. just very brief? Um, it's it's on the last page about the 30% applying only to rental units. Um, and uh, if somehow you were able to house somebody that was previously unhoused and they somehow through some program or some combination of things, they were able to enter into home ownership, you certainly would be able to count those people as well in that category. I just wanted to be clear and that we weren't excluding people from home ownership. Absolutely. Yes. Just as we uh, pull the data, we don't keep that tenant level data uh, in house. So it's in order to report on it. But yes, that would absolutely be a success. Okay. Other comments or questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, oh, that's yours. Oh, I moved it. Oh, that's why it's over there. Great. Thank you. <laughs> because I didn't think it was for me. <laughs> All right, so now we're going on to uh, Commissioner Jenkins. And included in the packet was a letter that I had sent um, on behalf of the committee um, for additional information because when we were doing Act 81, we actually incorporated some of the requests of the administration, but we didn't really have a lot of time to flesh out the thinking behind it. and. So um, appreciate your being here today, and uh, we'll let you take it from there. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks for having me for the record. Uh, Josh Hanford, Commissioner of Housing and Community Development. And it's great to go after uh, Polly and BACB, since a lot of this is, is coordinated effort. Um, and my, my uh, responses are, are, are to your letter largely, but just wanted to recognize that since that letter received on July 6th, we've had severe flooding. Uh, which has impacted residents and communities across the state and just highlight the importance of and recognize the fact that there's overlapping work here between what Act 81 um, looks to, to the issues it looks to solve and what we're dealing with now of impacted households to flooding. Um, you know, early data 211 uh, has reported, self-reported over 4,000 residential units impacted and over 700 self-reported units is uninhabitable. More FEMA information will verify that and, and we'll get to a, a, a number, but we know, you know 14 mobile home parks were impacted, 
four of them receiving sustainable losses, substantial losses, including 61 uninhabitable mobile homes. Um, we realized that FEMA support for folks that had damaged property, mac uh, the maximum benefit is $41,000. So if we have someone's home that's uninhabitable, uh, rental property that's uninhabitable, and repairing that, getting folks back in, and this focused work on the, the population, the cohort that, that um, this work contemplated helping that AHS went over earlier, there's going to be overlap and there's going to be impacts in, in, in doing that work. On to the specific questions. The first was related to the manufactured uh, home communities infill program, the 10 million that BHCB was asked to support infill and some questions about, you know, what do we know about uh, the opportunities here where they exist? So we've done a lot of work on this already. Uh, first, we have an annual mobile home park survey that all the mobile home park owners submit to the department. And we knew from that that there were 326 vacant lots across the state and another 126 that could be made uh, habitable. Varying amounts of work uh, in those lots. Some of them are easy minor repairs, some are substantial work. So to better understand that, we did a survey um, of mobile home park owners across the state, private, nonprofit, and co-op. Um, and we received responses, uh, and, and those were selected based on the priority areas from the AHS, da AHS data for where we have the most unhoused that we need to try to find housing for. So we focused on those five regions, those five counties, and we had, um, over, I think it was 23 mobile home park owner, 26 respond to our survey, which was a phone survey and a web follow up that had 82 vacant lots that could be ready for infill on an expedited timeline with no or minor repairs. In addition to that, um, our largest partner, Vermont State Housing Authority, which also has the largest, the, the largest mobile home park owner in the state, they had an additional 86 lots that could be potential for this infill program. So we also screen them against flood. You know, none of these are in under your floodplain. None of these um, parks were impacted by the flood. Well, that's encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for the but. <laughs> yeah. We also reached out to all the manufactured home dealers in the state and in bordering uh, New York and New Hampshire and found that um, within six to eight weeks of, of ordering and purchasing um, manufactured homes could be here. Uh, there's little existing stock, uh, you know, on, on the dealers, but they could get them in six to eight weeks. And we also looked at the average price of these new energy efficient manufactured homes. You know, HUD, these are HUD certified manufactured homes. The, the term mobile home is now manufactured home and they become much more energy efficient. Um, they're installed on a uh, frost-free foundation that is stamped by an installer, a licensed installer. Um, and so the cost has gone up quite a bit as well. So the cost of a new home on a site all hooked up is between $120,000 and $150,000. So this is quite an uh, increase from some earlier estimates of, of sort of what this $10 million could buy in the number of lots. But still, when you compare the average development cost of a new affordable housing of $400,000, it's still um, significantly more, more affordable. So with this, with this information and these estimates, we feel the one-time um, appropriation to BHCB to work on this pilot infill program could result in 60 to 80 uh, in, infill and, and families rehoused in uh, manufactured home communities in, in areas of, of high need. And so in working with VHCB, um, you know, they've also started some outreach and talking, and we've talked about what the mechanisms would be in place to ensure public benefit of this money. You know, um, uh, longstanding priority for petrol affordability and other mechanisms that would need to be in place to ensure we've got the right benefit for this. And there's lots of different options, I guess I would say. I, I think leaving VHCB the flexibility to determine what's the best um, course of action in the different mobile home park uh, op options and ownership levels is, is wise. You know, the simplest could be, you know, the VHIP model where we have a five to 10 year affordability period. It's a rental. That rental rate gets reported through the tax department, through the landlord uh, rental certificate where you can verify the rates are affordable. And over a period of time, 
that, that ends and goes away and that home continues to serve an affordable family or is purchased by an affordable family. We know our mobile home, our manufactured home community residents by and large are low income all the way up to perpetual ownership by a nonprofit owner that could sustain that home and transition it to an affordable ownership. There's, there's lots of ways to, to make this work depending on the ownership and, and the models that could be employed. And we, we've had those conversations with VHCB. I really appreciate all of this. I'm very helpful. I also appreciate that you keep on flip, um, flipping back and forth between mobile home and manufactured homes since people who live there tend to call yeah. them mobile homes. Um, but I appreciate how it's sort of like mono, modernizing towards manufactured. Um, I have a fairly obnoxious question, which is, it sounds to me from everything you've said and I've read here that you could have 60 to 80 families housed in manufactured homes in the next three months. Is that what you're thinking <laughs> that would be a goal i won't take it as a promise yes that would be a goal just try to create timelines that's not too obnoxious i think <laughs> yeah, I, know. I was you know i was going to give six months and think like that was really good oh, but months. obviously um, time is of the essence here so um the uh, the supply is out there, not necessarily in Vermont, but um, mm -hmm. so the immediacy of that response is certainly um, um, attractive. I think there would be, there is obviously an impact with the 61 homes that were just completely yeah. destroyed and then another 20, they'd have major uh, work. And so, you know, we'd be competing against ourselves with, with a, a larger need than what this was specifically for uh, the cohort that we're trying to exit uh, from the from the motel program, but there seems to be supply and there seems to be lots that could easily be made ready to accept them and not in flood and not in flood. Said, it is sort of a separate yeah. region, even though exactly. we're talking about. Okay, great, thank you. Oh uh, yes, yeah, is... so two questions. Uh, one is, what's the average configuration to see how many bedrooms or how many square feet yeah that, that's a that's a great question um the average is 80 feet long and i think uh, i don't remember if it's 14 or 18 feet wide but two bedroom okay the average thousand square feet yeah about a thousand square feet okay yep. um and secondly the folks that are in mobile homes that got destroyed in the recent flooding yep are they they're in a variety of places um that some of, some of which we don't know, but um, folks that were totally displaced, hopefully they reported to 211, registered with FEMA, and FEMA is starting to disperse uh, payments to them. So um, initial temporary payments, they could be in a hotel, a motel, they could have found a rental someplace else with a family friend, could be in a short-term rental, um, you know, Airbnb situation. And so, the, the, the challenge that we're in right now, because there's a lot of attention on, on some mobile home parks, as there should be, I visited the two in Berlin and they're totally wiped out. I mean, they, they should be looking at a buyout down the road. Is but FEMA bringing in any trailers? Because I know in hurricane areas uh, like Florida, they'll bring in trailers. I could, I could talk about that. That's a whole nother direct housing program through FEMA. That is a whole nother piece of work that we're doing. That's that's quite so substantial. Why don't we um, have that as part of our flood discussion okay. on that? I guess what we're saying is that just compounds the challenge that we've got here. I want to check on the two in Washington County. One is out on the Barry Montpelier Road. Mm -hmm. It's the other one in Berlin. Uh, Weston on the 12th. No, they're both in Berlin. Oh. One is called Berlin Mobile Home Park that is right near the AOT garage when we come yep. down the hill. And the other is River Run, which is just past the uh, Dunkin' Donuts on 302 yep. yes. down. down by the river. Okay. And Weston got hit in Irene, but I, I, I've seen it. it. It did all right this time. It flooded, but um, and they evacuated temporarily, but everyone's back in. They raised those lots after I ran. The, the owner raised every single lot and it, it worked. I mean, they had some issues with the infrastructure, you know, not being accessible, but the homes stayed dry. That's good to know. Yeah. Do you have one more question? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I can be quick. Um, I can be quick. The other, the, the manufactured home improvement and repair program, MER, we just funded last year um, with four million in um, ARPA funds. 
I have, you'll see in the write-up how successful that's been already. 96% of the funding has already been requested. We've had to put a hold on some of the programs. What we're finding, and our staff has visited 18 mobile home parks, I think, is for a $10,000 repair, we can keep someone housed where that home could be shut down. It, it could be uninhabitable and add to our homeless uh, challenges. And so we think another $4 million in this program is going to be very timely and, and prevent upstream um, more homelessness. We've already had meetings with the HCB. Our, uh, our, attorneys, uh, our attorneys have spoken about the most efficient way to transfer this money and essentially just add on to the program we already started just in February that's been very successful to date. And you can see numbers up there about the applicants and what we've been able to do. All right, so that's going to keep people in their homes. It doesn't add to, it doesn't compound um, the problem, but it doesn't help Right. provide any more capacity. What it has done too is, is give us an eye into these mobile home parks, these manufacturing communities and find where um, the better sort of opportunities are and the repairs and get some of these owners already um, aware that the state is trying to help them improve these communities. And so that's where we have more information about what to do in short term because we've already started to do it through a, this formal granting process. Um. Move right yep. Then we get to VHIP. You know about VHIP. Um, 617 units to date. That includes a number that are under construction right now. About 75% have gone to uh, rehouse uh, families exiting homelessness. Um, this five million from VHCB to support this effort, we'll, we'll do a couple things. One, it'll be targeted to those areas of the greatest need, and it'll be a chance to support these five homeowners centers that are doing this work with some a little bit more capacity because they've been stretched thin. They can't do any more because they don't have enough staff to do more. And so um, we think this this um, so added support will just enhance that program and set it up for uh, more future success. Um, the, to address one of the questions you specifically asked, Senator Kitchell, you know, when someone is referred an exiting homelessness to a unit, they've got to have the ability to pay rent, whether that's from their own earned income or rental assistance. And the rental assistance piece, just as the service piece that VHB mentioned, is critical for a landlord to be able to take uh, any tenant. Um, and so the challenge with the uh, voucher, the housing voucher program, it, it's a federal program. It has federal rules. There's, there's a, a coordinated process to award those vouchers and serve people exiting homelessness. Um, uh, but it's not a one for one, just the hotel population. It's everyone that needs housing that's in that system. And not all those individuals have a voucher at, at any given point. Um, what is good about Act 81 and the work we've done to transition now, folks that are in that cohort have to uh, be entered into the coordinated entry system so they can um, be offered a voucher and it, it makes the whole process more efficient. Because if you don't have a way to pay rent, it's pretty hard to, to house someone. Um, Representative, um, Representative. This, is, this is just a request for the next meeting um, between um, VHCB and, and you, uh, Commissioner, is, is uh, could we have a written definition of what uh, what is meant by people exiting homelessness? Because I learned that it's not exactly what we don't all necessarily have the same definitions of that. And how, how does that differ from what we've asked in um, Act 81? Yeah, just um, sort of an observation in all of these presentations, uh, there's been a little aside, and we need to pay more attention to this, about needing technical assistance or needing wraparound services, whether we need it for um, people helping, uh, helping uh, maintenance technicians. Uh, in this case, you talk about most of these parks are benefit from additional technical assistance for long-term park viability. I'd suggest we talk to the SBGC about that, for example. But I think we need to, there are additional costs that we need to think about as a legislature, as we're talking about building more units of whatever kind, there are other costs, whether it's wraparound services to the homeowners or to support the people who are building the homes that we're gonna to have to pay attention to. And just the last piece, I think uh, Paula covered it well, the, the uh, goal to uh, rehouse folks at, at 30% dedicated to folks exiting homelessness. Um, if we look at the turnover of units, 
in a year will actually be greater than the new units built in a year. And so that's a, a, uh, a helpful way to help us achieve that shared goal. Thank you. Other comments or questions? I, I yeah. just back up. Um, Senator Westman? Um, the help for the communities themselves. I have um, a community that has uh, put an extraordinary number of units in, and the community has um, had their local budget go down three times and, um, and headed to a Georgia fourth book. And um, they need increased police, and there's a hump between getting those units in. And most of the units you're talking about when, when they say you're going to get property tax off of them, do not pay for themselves in the community so they're facing a tax increase. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now the last housing related is the um, update on the council. And um, uh, Mr. Hanford, you're um, one of the co-chairs along with Secretary Samuelson. Um, and we just wondered, this was created in the governor's executive order and um, obviously it's intended to be kind of the place where all this work and um, policy development and um, data analysis is um, being brought together. So I, I guess you're the designated hitter. Uh, <laughs> I don't see Secretary Samuelson I, coming I up. I can tell you that I think we have, the same, we have, the, same, uh, we have the same update. Um, so all of the positions have been uh, appointed. Uh, all the folks that have, um, we had to choose from the various uh, organizations that were mentioned have all been submitted to governor, picked and have been informed. We're trying to get the first meeting scheduled. Uh, unfortunately, we um, weren't able to move as fast on this um, with, with the flooding and just getting sidetracked, but that has all happened. Folks have been informed. And I think the goals of that council looking towards uh, establishing what do we need for units by region, by type, um, how are we going to achieve that and how are we going to measure ourselves uh, against that goal is work that is happening in various other places already right now and in a very um, uh, consistent way but having it housed with with this new council and having an annual report to bring that all together and, and we're having these same discussions with towns and with rpcs they're all looking to uh, establish their goal for housing needs and then a plan to how to achieve it that you can measure yourself against. You know, I think we all know the challenges, the workforce, the construction, all that, but having a goal and then measuring how you're doing it, it is the, it, the first place you, you start. And so that effort is underway. This council will bring it together and provide a good way to. Um, okay. uh, do you have technical assistance on that council to provide strategic planning support for you all, or are you doing that? That is a great question. I think we've we've identified um, that for that committee to have the um, sort of bandwidth to be successful, it would be great to have someone help facilitate some of that work because everyone on that council is a leadership level position and it's great for setting goals and making decisions but we will need a body of work to happen and that to be directed um and, and so i don't have an answer other than that we've identified it and talked about it and seeing if we can find some resources to support that work i love that thank you it will be very helpful in the council if as we talk about this we talk about forty thousand units statewide where do we have septic capacity? What do we have for septic capacity? What do we have um, for water? The first thing any developer does is look at what they can get for infrastructure, septic and water, and transportation is, or access to highways is something after that. But clearly, um, I've never, I haven't seen any report put together aware of what we need in that. And I would say in the earlier documents we saw about um, um, uh, the presentation of 750 out of the um, 1,200 or 1,000 need one bedroom units. And we've never been able to highlight where we need and um, what we need for units. It's a lot different building a one bedroom unit than building a three bedroom. 
Agreed. I, I, you know, our current housing needs assessment does dive into that a little bit. We know we need more one and two bedroom um, rather than family units. We have a, a, a there's a, a regional breakdown in our existing housing needs assessment that talks about strategies of rehabilitation versus net new. But this work will help refine that as well as bring in that info about where the infrastructure exists. Because you're right, you can't solve this problem without infrastructure, which gets into the greater challenge of our flooding. And I think where we have some of that infrastructure, there's some challenges with those historic um, developed areas in relation to our floodplain and where our rivers are. And we need to think long term about how to uh, address that. I just had a community lose its sewage treatment. Right. I think Winooski did there for a while. Yeah. Um, all right, thank you. Well, we'll look forward to the work of the council. And um, Secretary Samuelson, the, um, the executive order said either HS secretary or deputy, and she's informed me that um, she is going to be serving as, your, as the um, co-chair. So thank you for that. Um, now we're going to move on to another uh, topic. Um, the, uh, 2023 um, storms. And we have Kristen, Cla it's Kristen. Oh, yeah. Oh, there you are. Um, Kristen Clouser, Secretary of Administration, and um, uh, Secretary Curley from the Community Development. And, um, and then um, I don't know whether, why don't we do the um, um, first, one, uh, first one as it relates, this is to the business grants. And then um, uh, we have just finished up a proposal that we'll be taking up at the e-board this afternoon that would help uh, um, households that have experienced damage. So uh, we'll start with the business grants and then we'll do a brief summary of what is uh, being proposed to assist homeowners. And um, thank you for helping us over the weekend get something ready for action on the um, homeowner front as well. So thank you. Um, so Secretary Clauser, are you the lead of the center? I think so. So just by um, proximity, I suppose. So um, it's, it's, I'm glad to be here. Just and I hope your birthday party went well. It did. Oh, <laughs> Nine-year-olds don't notice when mom ducks out every once in a while. So <laughs> skated through. Um, for the record, I'm Kristen Clouser. I'm the Secretary of Administration. I have with me Deputy Secretary Doug Farnham. Um, he is going to give a little bit of insight on kind of the economic gaps we've identified with respect to federal funding and additional aid that's coming into the state. And then um, Secretary Curley is with me as well, specifically to talk about the business grants. We were going to talk generally flood, flood relief and response first, mm -hmm. and then get into the business grants, if, yes. if that makes sense in terms of scheduling. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So I don't think I need to remind anyone on this panel, um, the 36 hours of steady rain we received on July 10th and 11th and subsequent storms afterwards, which led to catastrophic funding in um, many areas of the state. Because of the forecast prior to that event, um, there was already a declared state of emergency, which um, Governor Scott declared on July 9th. That allowed FEMA resources to come immediately to the state. They were here prior to the flooding event that also activated the State Emergency Operations Center. Which, so with the ninth include the funding because there was the washout in Killington. So is it, it would it, yes that would be okay. okay. That's right. So so the the um, event started on the ninth on the ninth, which is the Friday flooding events in Killington. Because it was obviously weather before the big. That's right, and mudslides and washouts, and it started that kind of led to the situation where additional rainfall on top of already saturated lands um, and increase the impact of what was, you know, historic levels of rain in some areas over nine inches of recorded rain in that 36 hour period, which is really significant. So because of that early declaration, the State Emergency Operations Center was already in place. We have been able to leverage resources from other states. We had swift water teams strategically in place in areas of expected flooded 
flood so that we could respond as quickly as possible. Um, and I will say, despite being three weeks out from the, when the, those events first started, because of the initial storm and then subsequent storms afterwards, every couple of days, um, it did take you know seven to ten days before we could really start shifting more into recovery and less in immediate response um, and health and safety concerns. So now we have some information that we can provide, but it's really important to understand that this is very preliminary. We're still pulling in data. This, this data I'm about to talk about is um, as of Thursday evening, so it's probably <laughs> changed significantly since then. And we'll continue to um, talk about you know, where we are as those numbers climb. But it's just really important to understand that this is preliminary data with respect to damage and early estimates of impact. So state infrastructure damage. Um, there were 18 state buildings that were impacted by the flood. Thousands of employees have been displaced. Um, luckily, thanks to all of the technological advancements during the pandemic, we were able to switch almost immediately to, um, to remote work and then have been able to find coop locations for many of the um, departments and agencies that can't work remotely but needed to work. So there was a minimal impact and for state government operations, which is good news. Um, but we will be dealing with bringing these buildings back online over the course of the next several months. Some buildings with lesser impacts will hopefully be back online mid-August. Others will take at least another 90 days to come back online because of the way the flooding impacted the major systems of those buildings that were located in the basement of big old buildings. Um, so we have elevator damage and HVAC damage and data law, data damage and you name it. So there's some buildings um, that will take longer to come back online. We had several state parks that sustained damage. We're working to bring those back online as we speak. 136 state roads and three bridges sustained damage. One bridge was destroyed. 305 miles of state-owned rail lines were closed due to flooding and significant washout damage. Before you keep, I notice. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's just Lampers got her hand up. Um, Emily just gave me a poke to bring <laughs> attention to your hand up. Sorry, uh, your question. Thank, thank you, Madam Chairs. Um, I did have a question about the state buildings. You said 18 state buildings were impacted. And I'm just going to make an assumption on that, that the location of them were pr primarily in either Waterbury or Montpelier. Would that be correct? Yes, yeah, so the vast majority of those were in downtown Montpelier. We had some buildings kind of outside the downtown area, including Waterbury, that had a little bit of um, damage to the grounds, right? The parking lot of Waterbury, but there was no damage to the Waterbury State Office Complex, no water inside that building. The same is said for the public safety building and um, in Waterbury. Some of the buildings outside of the immediate downtown area in Montpelier sustained minimal damage. DOL, for example, um, had a, a, an inch or so in the basement of that building, but we were able to get that out really quickly and, um, and dry that building out. So, so some buildings outside of downtown Montpelier sustained very minimal damage and are back online now. Currently, it's mostly it's downtown Montpelier. Great. Well, well, thank you. I, I had actually had a conversation with the, the chair of, uh, of House Institutions and Correction as they went on a tour of some of the damage and had heard uh, that are the tunnel and things, the, the flooding impact at the, you know, the mechanical rooms, but mostly the elevators, which and from what I'm hearing you say that it'll be a short time before they're back online, the ability to operate the elevators is is going to be you know the ADA compliant piece in those buildings um 
So that's much exactly question. right. So the elevators can be back online that fast? Nope. So there, out of the 18 buildings, there are some buildings that will be back online by mid-April, or I'm sorry, mid-August. <laughs> um, and more. That's right. But some of our larger buildings, like 133, for example, the elevators were impacted. 109, the pavilion, the elevators were impacted. There are a couple of other buildings where the elevators are impacted. They will have a much longer um, time period before they can get back online. Those buildings also had major systems impacted in addition to the elevators. The elevators and old buildings are programmed to go to the basement when the power goes off. So that's where they all were. And there's only like one elevator mechanic in the whole region, too, I think. That's right. Uh, well, now there's two. <laughs> um, but the real problem with the elevators are parts. The supply chain issue on elevator parts is sometimes 18, 20 weeks before we can actually get the parts in for those. So you're, you're exactly right. The elevators will, will take longer. And when in the buildings where those have been impacted, they won't be offline for a longer period of time. So that would be my, as we go forward with this and assessing the damage and the, and the cost of getting an accounting will develop over time as to the impact and the cost of, to the state as their buildings become more and more um, evaluated as well. So that'll be a part of our, our bigger flood relief piece is what's, what is our buildings and what are we gonna do in the future to make sure that this doesn't happen or at least minimize it in the future, huh? That's right. I, I can jump there next, which is early estimates of damage. Do that because we're, um, we Thank you. need to- uh, You're running over. Yes. Thank <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for alerting your timekeeper as well, Madam Chair. I think that's the task. No, well, I think um, I'm well aware I keep looking at the clock, so I don't want to rush because this is really important and obviously people want to have a good sense. Um, but if you could. The document you're talking about, so do we have that here? No. Oh, no, the, these are just my, the, these are actually my talking points prepared for something totally different that I'm just stealing bits and pieces of it to present to you today. That all legislative briefing. Yeah, didn't we get some info? Is there a way to get a summary from? Yes, so there's a recording of the all legislative briefing that I believe Kendall Smith sent around last week to all the legislators that has much of the information I'm talking about today, but more importantly, it has a lot of the resources that are available for those impacted by flooding. So we can, I can, um, we can send that back around. That's a recording of that briefing and then all of the questions. We also have, if you go to um, vermont.gov slash flood, that is a landing page that has all of the resources available as well, but it doesn't I mean, have. I'm not as interested in the resources because I do have the Kendall's in that list. I'm more interested in um, being able to hone in on what the damage was. Sure. So I have early estimates of what we have thus far as of last week for damage. Additional damage is coming in daily. So I, again, I know I've said that ad nauseum, but I want to repeat it again. Um, our total estimated damage for state buildings exceeds $45 million. A lot of that depends on what systems can be salvaged and what systems have to be totally replaced. Um, so we expect that to exceed 45 million. We don't know how much more it will be yet. Real property damage from individuals reported to FEMA as of last week was 8.4 million, over $8.4 million. Total estimated damage from, that's just real property damage reported to FEMA from individuals, $8.4 million as of last week. So the total, right, that's just real property damage. It doesn't include, that's right. Then there's the total FEMA public assistance estimate of damages, right? That's roads, bridges, mm -hmm. infrastructure, essentially. Um, that's 
$92 million, over $92 million. Total estimate of damage for the federal highways, impacted state and federal highways is another 60, $36 million. Again, that's as of last week. So it may be entirely different. Um, in addition, we have $10 million of individual assistance reported to FEMA as well, but that number is gonna continue to skyrocket as um, FEMA gets in there and does individual assessments with folks. We have nine counties that have been approved for individual assistance, 11 counties that have been approved for public assistance. And then all counties have been approved for FEMA funding for emergency protective measures and hazard mitigation statewide. I have, and that individual assistance includes things like temporary housing, temporary housing units, repair replacement of owner occupied home, hazard mitigation assistance, um, and kind of a medley of other things that folks would be available for that they can stack through the individual assistance. Is that or not? So are you including municipal expenses or loss like town highways, town roads? So what is that, that one of these numbers? So that there may be pieces of again, this is what was reported to us from FEMA, okay. right? Or reported to FEMA, I should say. So that may include pieces of municipal damage through the um, public assistance estimated damages. The individual, even if you combine both numbers, it still seems really low. That's right. Um, is that I mean, is FEMA behind in terms of processing applications? This is only what has been actually filed and reviewed. So three, over 3,000 residents have applied for individual assistance thus far. Yeah. And again, this is as of Friday, right? That That's as good as my numbers are. Um, there have been over 2,000 home inspections requested. FEMA's completed 1.1400, 1 just over 1400 of right, those so these yet. These so are more than the, these are okay. very early. likely very low, very early baseline numbers. It's just what we have thus far. So you're giving us close to $200 million right now, total damage. I don't even know if that includes uh, commercial property. No. No. So no. there could be another 50 to 100 million there. I don't know. I'm guessing. Um, what on average is uh, match requirements? So it depends on the time. It depends on the damage. It depends on the county. Um, there's a 30, and um, Doug has been dealing with a lot of the FEMA federal funding and, and how it overlaps with ARPA. So he will, he is free to jump in and correct me or add to this at any time. There's a 30 day period, which we have not designated yet. That's a hundred percent match. Response and recovery efforts are typically a hundred percent match. Certain programs also have higher match. If we get it, if we hit a particular level of a threshold of damage, then it shifts from a 25% match to a 10% match. We do like the 90-10. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Um, and I and that's why people should call two on one. Yes, yes absolutely. So, uh, we believe that the threshold is 112 million, um, but it is somewhat discretionary on FEMA's part. They, they have to make that decision. So it's not an automatic trigger, um, but we do anticipate it's around 112 million of verified public assistance and individual assistance. And we've requested 100% of um, FEMA reimbursement. There hasn't been a decision yet from FEMA, but that, that was the request and that's what it, we've been working with our federal delegation to push. I think it's unlikely that we receive that, but we're trying. This is for the state expenses? Yes. Okay, so the state buildings, highway, so, so for state build for state buildings, it's going to be a, a patchwork of things. We do have flood insurance through the national flood insurance. We have private flood insurance that we maintain. We can access that flood insurance up to our forty-five million dollar cap. 
Um, there's a deductible required for that. That will be probably between five and $10 million by the time we're done to leverage that $45 million of funding. And then FEMA funding would be available on top if the damage goes beyond our insurance limits. FEMA will come in and be available. And there's um, certain grants and programs dealing with mitigation that we may be able to fund to leverage FEMA for as well. I'd like to indicate that we're going to be scheduling another our September meeting earlier in September. So um, which will mean we've got the uh, benefit of the August experience and that should give us uh, obviously uh, a lot more information. A lot more information um, uh, that we would have available at that point. So uh, I'm going to um, uh, move from more questions to uh, finishing up and then moving into the business grants. Um, and then we'll go into uh, uh, what we have for individual assistance um, as well with um, short and with Peter Walk. So, um, so Secretary Curley is here to tell us. Unless it's about. more information about, but we're kind of going over an update on and what we have. I'm, I'm happy to um, chat individually with with folks and provide information on the um, what is, we have thus far. Is there like a, a, a week update, you know, for all the information that you've given relative to damages reported from public assistance individual? I, I'm just wondering, maybe that's that help answer some of so them. We do file addenda to the um, declaration with FEMA that lists damages, but, you know, by the time we have that information, it's likely stale yeah. because it's collected and then presented. Is that, but, on, is that on the website that you mentioned? Oh, the flood? The FEMA yeah. declarations? I, I can I can check on that. We can send them to you. Um, I can check to see if we put the FEMA declarations out there. So I guess at this point, I'm going to move on to the um, uh, business grant um, proposal um, that has been advanced. It's going to be um, uh, part of the e-board um, uh, action this afternoon uh, to help fund that um, program that has been presented to our uh, joint um, uh, economic development committees and commerce committees uh, last last week. Um, so if there are not any further questions and in looking at the time, um, I'm going to move on to Secretary Curley. Great. Uh, for the record, I'm Lindsay Curley, Secretary of the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. I know you were pressed for time, so I'll give you a little bit about this and then let you direct how far, how, ma how many details you want to go into here. Um, as Secretary Clauser mentioned, um, as the um, days have you know unfolded after the, the severe storms, we've worked diligently to um, try to identify gaps that existed with, with respect to um, harm uh, around the state. And it became very evident um, that um, one gap, one area that we were seeing very quickly was um, in the in, with respect to uh, the business community. And certainly folks have lost their homes. It's devastating. Um, and we, you know, there are some resources and tools to help in that arena. But with our businesses, who, you know, people who provide jobs uh, and keep our communities going, uh, there was very little. I do want to acknowledge SBA disaster does have loans. They're very helpful to those that will qualify. Um, there are some good terms, um, no payments for a year and uh, no interest for a year. So again, I don't want to uh, not acknowledge that, but for some that won't qualify or who are still very um, um, highly leveraged. Hi, thank you. <laughs> if that's what highly leveraged. Actually, I have a copy of the uh, Pro's program. Okay. And maybe I, we should just make it uh, available to committee members. Um, it's the Emergency Gap Assistance Program, and it's yep. uh, $20 million. Exactly. And um, uh, I can, uh, maybe we could have copies made, because I think that would help. That, that would be great. I, I apologize. I assumed everybody had it, but um, so I think we just Yeah, don't copy the back of this. I recycle um, reprint on the other side. So I'll talk sort of slowly while you do that. But so the, the purpose of the program is to provide $20 million um, to businesses and nonprofits that is that sustain physical damages. So this is not for economic injury right now. We are focused on physical damages 
um, and applicants, uh, the, the goal is for them to, um, it, they need to establish that they do intend to be open and um, bring back their employees and get, uh, get back to work or get to work on repairing the damages as soon as possible. We know that this will not uh, fix everything. Uh, this is really an emergency um, uh, cash flow for them to get started on some of that work. Some folks uh, are afraid to to hire somebody to you know do the cleaning or to rip out a floor that needs to be ripped out because if they don't have the money to pay for that, they don't want to be on the hook to owe somebody if they don't have the very cash you needed to pay that person that they've hired to do the work. So the way we have designed this program is that we would provide um, the, uh, the lesser of 20% of their net uncovered damages with a cap of $20,000. So what does net uncovered damage mean? That means they are going to demonstrate to us what their damage is, and that could be in the form of estimates or actual um, invoices that they've, they've incurred and uh, less any flood insurance they may have. And what we're asking them to show us are grants or donations that have been provided to them for the purpose of repairs, right? So if they have received a grant to repair a floor, we don't wanna provide them with a grant to repair that floor again, right? So if they've received a grant or a donation for something completely outside of damages, that's fine. We're not going to you know, have them deduct that. But if they've used a grant or donation already to defray the cost of damages, we need to um, deduct that from our calculation. So, um, so that's how the, the uh, calculation will be done. We will, um, for applicants who have net uncovered damages greater than a million dollars, we do have another category we'll look at um, and we'll provide the lesser of 20% of the net uncovered damages or uh, there are a few thresholds depending on how many FTEs they are, there are. So again, remember our goal here is to bring employees back to work, um, get the doors open. So um, there will be uh, a weighted, you know, based on the fact that they have more employees and they're getting more people back to work. If they've already opened and they've gone into debt to do that, this will cover. They can still, they can still apply. Absolutely. Um, we won't hold that against them. We recognize that, you know, some are able to leverage it in a variety of ways and, and get moving. So I have a story that um, um, the new owners have been there 30 days. Uh, and and they've reopened. Oh yeah, yeah. we've heard some stories where there were businesses that literally um, closed that day. The closings were that day. So um, yeah, we're going to be we're going to work with people. We want them to succeed. Uh, do you want to go to? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I've been reading that some businesses have uh, been doing GoFundMe campaigns. Right. And uh, is there some way you're able to tell whether, I mean, they could, they're raising $100,000, could be for general purposes, which may go to the floor. Right. right. So you have some way to figure out what. We're asking, you're, you're just asking them to attest. We're asking them to attest. And again, we recognize, you know, this is going to be on, you know, your honor. Again, if, if, I, I don't know if you've walked through the downtowns, like I've said to people, again, I'm, I'm honest, <laughs> you, you have to look at your neighbor and know that if you take more than, than you, you know, your right. arm, you have to remember that you're looking at the person next to you who didn't, who didn't get that. So I, we're just really hoping, we also, you know, I have to say, you're getting 20% of your net damages. And it's like, again, it's, there's arguably going to be a, a, lot, a large gap that you have to fill. And we do want people to stack there, um, whether it be loans or other grants. We want people to stack to try to come up with it. And you know, one number I've heard, and I don't know if this number has changed, but in Montpelier, for example, I heard the average, average uh, loss, business loss was $186,000. So, um, so if somebody gets 20,000 for their damages, it's right, there's still going to be a long way. So, I know this is not perfect. Um, we're trying to make sure that people aren't, you know, we don't have a duplication of benefits. Right. We're going to do the best we can, but I'm also acknowledging that this is. It's hard. It's, it's hard. not enough. And I, we understand. Yeah. That. But 
something. Full disclosure, yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Um, as I said, our two committees um, had uh, a lot of testimony last week, as well as um, pre your presentation of the proposal. Um, and yes, question. Senator Cummings. Is this going out as, do they have to upfront the repair, or is this going out as cash? It's, it's going out as cash. They don't have to upfront it. We also recognize, again, like coming on the heels of COVID, it is, there are so many people that are they need cash. They need cash. Okay. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Councilor Cummings, you had your hand up. Um, and that, now we're going to move on to, and I don't know if you want to stay for this, uh, Secretary. I'm, I'm happy, happy to stay if helpful. Oh. Uh, well, one never knows. <laughs> <laughs> when no was being that is true. Uh, Thank you. I'll give up my middle seat though. How's that? All right. That's right. More in a supportive role. That's right. That's right. All right. So um, uh, our next witness is Peter Watt, Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont. And over the last several days, uh, there's been an awful lot of work to look at where we have um, appropriations that are out that really could be um, um, uh, directed toward um, helping um, uh, flood victims. And this is really looking at um, households, many of uh, which have experienced significant loss, heating systems, appliances, and so forth. So what we have um, is another um, area of providing uh, some financial relief uh, to Vermont uh, households. And uh, this will also be taken, taken up this afternoon at the e-board, um, this uh, use of funds. So if you would like to just give us hot off the press. Uh, Can I just say that as we look at Montpelier and how quickly it is recovering, a lot of that credit goes to Peter who managed <laughs> The thousands of volunteers, and that is no small task. Well, that's public recognition well deserved. Thank you. <laughs> and now you're going to even get more recognition yes. for uh, um, what we uh, have before us today. And I know that people were working over the weekend, and you were you were in the Adirondacks on going to a funeral, and Secretary Clouser was trying to have a birthday party, and um, Jen Carby was trying to camp, and you know, all of us were uh, in the midst of trying to get something ready for today. So it's, it's, it was quite a combined effort, and I just want to recognize everybody, and um, uh, Representative Kornheiser, um, if I got more emails from you, I, I was like, <laughs> so, um, so with that said, if you want to just give us um, sort of a, a review of how we distilled um, what you were um, putting forward in terms of action today. So I uh, appreciate your being here on such short notice. Sure. For the record, Peter Walk, uh, Managing Director of Efficiency Vermont. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, while there was a lot of work the past few days, I think that's uh, government leadership at its best, coming together to solve problems that people are facing. So, um, uh, I think this is a great way to dovetail with the presentation from Senator or for, from Secretary Curley uh, on the business side. This is an attempt to provide some relief and financial aid to those residents who have been impacted by flooding and who have lost critical equipment uh, as part of that flood. Right, heating systems, uh, hot water systems, uh, other other sort of key appliances within a home. And to provide that opportunity, especially for our low and moderate income neighbors, to be able to provide assistance to go beyond what FEMA might reimburse them for to the most efficient uh, available models available to them, to really lean into providing that assistance so that they can have reduced their energy burden in the, in the long run, but really to be able to make this change, to be able to stand in and, and help uh, with assistance in this moment when they're all thinking about how do I heat my homes? How do I provide hot water for my family over the course of the next few months? This is the moment. And so I appreciate the, the response from, um, uh, from the legislature and the administration to step forward and say, this is the right thing to do in this, in this moment. So the idea is to repurpose, uh, to move uh, from uh, $35 million in weatherization that was to flow through efficiency through the public service department 
to up to $10 million of that money uh, to a, a, another purpose uh, by which the Public Service Department can then use it to grant uh, to Vision Vermont to manage this program, to get resources out the door to those flood victims who need it as quickly as possible, uh, to make it available to, uh, uh, to single family homes, to multifamily dwellings, to owners and renters, uh, and, and figure out the landlord rental combination as quickly as possible so that we can make sure that those resources are available this coming uh, heating season. So, uh, questions, or we have some quick question. Thank you for this. Does this include all 14 counties, not just the FEMA designated counties? I'm not a little, I don't remember what the executive order was. The... So, what, right. what, I mean, flood impacted. Yes. Right. So, so somebody in Addison County isn't, dead, but I've had talked to constituents who have lost things. So they would be eligible to apply. Yes. If they were impacted by the flood, yes, they would be eligible. Okay. And somehow they'll know how to do that. And yes, <laughs> the, you know, we're in early stages of, of ensuring we but know. But that would be a designated right. area. That's in right. order sure. to qualify. Right. That's right. That, this is not, it's not FEMA money. It's right. the allocation of ARPA, ARPA money yeah. within an allowable use for ARPA, which is not dependent on a FEMA designation. And you have some communication and outreach plan so that people will know that they can apply for this? So uh, that's what Efficiency Vermont does, is communications and outreach. And so we will get this board out to, and, and we're gonna partner with uh, state agencies on their ability to communicate directly with those who filed through 2 on one and uh, all other means to get information out as quickly as possible. The moment that we're in right now is the decision-making cycle that people are in, right? I have talked to folks on the ground as, uh, Senator Cummings mentioned I took a week off and I helped organize volunteer efforts in Montpelier. I understand on the ground what people are going through. Yeah. Uh, I had lots of conversations with business owners and with uh, uh, residents who are trying to figure out what decisions to make first. And they're starting to think about, especially as we, you know, finally felt some relief the past couple of days and cool mornings. Communication in the winter is coming. Uh, <laughs> like, like late summer, didn't it? Uh, Senator Cummings has a question or a comment? No, I just have asked anybody else. I'll ask you. I know we've had supply chain issues, both with uh, heat pumps, those kinds of things, also with furnaces. And we've got essentially a three month window to get heat into people's homes. Have we looked into the availability of the, you know, this is the time to make the changeover if you can, but can we get the product? Yes, so that's one of the first things that we did was ask that question. And we stay on top of that all the time. We have a team that is actually devoted to managing the supply chain so that we can make sure that when we incentivize something that it's available and can be used. Obviously that doesn't, you know, work. it's not perfect, right? We, there are challenges and we don't normally have to replace this sort of scale no. at the same time. At the same time, that needs to be our focus. We would, um, we can, we are gonna do everything we can within the supply chain to make sure that those, those resources are available. As it comes to uh, furnaces and other things, um, as the focus in Vermont policy has shifted away from more efficient uh, fuel oil or propane based systems to uh, electrification and biomass and the like, though we don't have a cl as clear sense of what the supply chain looks like, but that's certainly something that we can partner with the Fuel Builders Association and others to think about. I, I just don't want to see us increase our homeless population because we get to November and we don't have heat in, in homeless and people will do what People will do anything to keep their families warm. So we need to really be right. up. Right. And this, up this is our opportunity to help them have the best available options. Other comments or questions? I, I just want to make a quick comment if I could, Madam. Right. Yes. Um, just to tie on to yeah. that. Uh, so Efficiency Vermont ran an HVAC program for us um, following the immediate impact of the pandemic. And we had all the same concerns about supply chain and you did an amazing job as an organization queuing up all of those hundreds of districts and we were able to service 200 plus districts with new HVAC. So I have every confidence in you and I thank you publicly for bailing us out on that emergency and now taking on this. So it's great to have Efficiency Vermont there. 
And on that note, um, I'm just letting you know in 10 to 15 minutes, to add to our time pressure, there is a fire alarm test. <laughs> Can't we just tell them no? And there will be a voice over a speaker and two short announcements, and they're sorry for the interruptions. <laughs> 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 but we don't have to exit the room. We don't have to exit. Just put our fingers in our ears. Okay. Yeah. There'll be some, something coming over the speaker. So just to alert you, uh, uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Okay. Um, so when will this program be available? Oh, well, this is it. Yes, Representative Wood, on that note. <laughs> I just was wondering what's the um What's the time frame for this to be active on your website? And sure. Okay. Uh, what, what there's there's likely to be a two step process. The first is to get information out that that help is coming. Not a, not dissimilar to the way the business grants were communicated, so that folks knew that help was coming and they could start to incorporate that into their decision making. We need to we need to develop the plane as we fly. Um, so there's much work to be done there. Um, the other piece is we will need to go through a, a granting process with the public service department. We are looking for other sources of, of funds that we could use that could potentially move quicker uh, that say are subject to the PUC's jurisdiction over our budget. Um, if we can do that, then we can start to move on some things more quickly. Um, the other piece we may consider as, as you just heard from, um, from the administration, the there is the same level of challenge and, and fewer resources available to the businesses impacted. Uh, we may have some funds that are less uh, constrained that we could use to help there. We're gonna explore that concept, but the money, the program in front of you is entirely for residential. We'll, we will continue to explore and see what makes uh, what's possible, but we wanna get communication as quickly as possible out to folks that help is coming and then communicate the specifics as people uh, begin to share more information. So, so that actually ends up, uh, in my district at least, creating more anxiety as opposed to less by saying help is coming and then not telling people how that help is coming. But it, it, businesses and residential, we're not, not sure, I'm not sure that communication strategy is helpful. But. Uh, or some time frame. When, when, yeah, okay. you know, if, if I'm going to talk about this and I'm going to walk into a community that's devastated, I I need to say we hope to have it up by September, October, whenever. Yes, yes. If we have some idea. Well, perhaps we can get that information out. A little, you have to recognize this is put exactly. together and the document you have was finalized about 9.30 last <laughs> night. So um, there's more yeah. information coming and obviously urgency, time, we forget. Um, but one thing is certain, we winter is gonna be upon us too quickly. So I think everybody understands the urgency here to move and we'll get maybe more information out um, as it becomes available. And I do, I do appreciate the questions about timing and we will, anything we communicate will project out when additional details will follow so people will know uh, that and when to look. We will do everything our can to move this as fast as possible. Great. Thank you very much. Um, at this, I'm going to move on to um, uh, the next item, items, and these are all action. Thank you. Um, so, you can see. Both of you have won, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and because we are meeting, we have uh, a number of um, grant approvals, and uh, we want to move through them pretty quickly. They've been sent out. One is a very large one here. Um, and um, why don't we get started? The first one is um, uh, JFO number 3115, and that is um, a very large number of positions. I know this is something uh, some people have been contacted about, getting the positions um, approved, and um, this is for the preschool development grant. Um, and so uh, we, this is an action item to approve the creation of these limited service um, positions. 
uh, that would be supported under this grant. Uh, yes, Representative Oh my God. The is that in our budget for the various agencies? The required 30% match. I know some of it's from outside organizations, but the match is that in our budget as passed. I'm not in appropriations, so I shouldn't add, well, I shouldn't it's answer not my the area, question. So I, I don't know, but maybe um, uh, Diane or Robin. Or Richie, or, um, or um, legislative right. counsel Sarah right. Clark would know. Um, I would assume that um, we also have the commissioner. Um, the commissioners. Is, is here and would. Um, okay, why don't we uh, actually, um, Deputy uh, Commissioner, yep. I, um, why don't you come up and maybe you can answer that question? Sorry, um, there's 800000 for DCF, there's uh, Agency of Education, yeah, it's got 212, yeah. et cetera. Uh -huh. And the short answer is yes. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, hi. You want to put yourself on the record? Sure. And we're now, Jan McLaughlin, Deputy Commissioner in Department of Children and Families overseeing the Child Development Division. Um, and will you just repeat the question again? Sorry. Which it's the so, match. So the, match the, 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 the match required for this yes. grant, to accept this grant, is that in our budget or are we going to have to sort of pull this out of the air somewhere? Um, the match is planned and it's largely planned through actually the philanthropic match with partners that are part of the grant overall. So, okay, but 800,000 for DCF is that in your budget? It's included as uh, reporting we're getting in from our partners. So I can get, I might have to get back to you on this. I know that's all, or Shay Shayla, do sorry. Uh, I'm, Right. relatively new to state government so these exact specific questions so all right well uh, um, so livingston is gonna she's smiling today <laughs> welcome <laughs> shayla hey everybody shayla yeah, Livingston. answer to the question yes policy director for the agency of human services for the record um so yes it's in our budget we do not need more money okay that was what i meant to say yeah. All right. So, um, any other questions about this? Um, obviously, this is something that you've been tracking. Um, it's been part of the discussion, I imagine. In yes, we had, we had an extensive. Uh, Madam Chair, Madam, yes. I just, sorry for the interruption. I just, um, I just want. I just noted that the on the agenda, the 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 uh, JFO numbers three one one five, and on the actual document, it's three one five. Okay, just it's three one five five. Thank you. We do correct the agenda. What, what, what number is it supposed to be? Three one five five. So yes, Madam Chair, we uh, had a presentation about this. It's expected. It's this will help our system of care really move forward. Um, so on that note, would you yes. like to make a motion? I would love to make a motion that we approve the positions. For, oh, we have a specific thing here. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, I move to approve 14 limited service positions, seven at the Department for Children and Families, two at the Department of Health, one at the Department of Mental Health, three at the Agency of Education, and one at the Office of Racial Equity. The positions are funded under a grant from the previously approved preschool development grant, JFO number 2970. We have a second, second. Of, a second um, Senator Cummings. Unless there's further discussion, I'll call the roll. Senator Baru. Yes. Senator Cummings. Yes. Representative Harrison. Yes. Uh, Representative Lamford. Yes. Representative Shy. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. I think that was a yes. Senator Sears, you were muted. Sorry. Yes. Good. Senator Westman. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yeah. Should we be holding the vote? What? Is there a problem? All right, guys. The motion is for 14 limited service positions. That's correct. Correct. Yes. And the grant manager position was moved from Department of Health to Department of Children and Families. Okay. Uh, and so that should be eight at Department of Children and Families, okay. one at Department of Health, and one at Department of Health. Oh. Oh. Okay. All right, so you need to. Uh, so amended in my motion. All right. <laughs> Thank so, you. So it's eight, one, and one. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, Senator Kitchell. Does, let me, okay. before I vote, that correction, does it 
impact anybody's vote on the approval of the grant uh, of the, the limited service positions. Okay, um, I'll vote yes. Yes. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. No, yes. I keep. That's fine. Okay, thank you. So the vote was 10-0. All right. Um, now we'll move on to um, a grant 3156. It says two limited service positions to the Agency of Human Services. And um, we have He's someone. Right there. Oh, oh, okay. Philip Calling is um, here um, remotely. Um, and um, uh, do we have questions? Uh, we have the explanation of uh, the request and it's to recruit, recruit and support and train AmeriCorps um, members, partially funded. Um, so uh, anything that you would like to um, add to the request, Mr. Colling, regarding um, the two limited service positions at the Agency of Human Services? Hi, yes, the only thing I'll add is that we just received notice uh, that next for next year, they're going to be moving to 18 months grant periods for these grants. Uh, so we are expecting that from January 1, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. Uh, the two grants in question will be funded and uh, the numbers for those for the commission support grant, they're giving us 295,000 and for the commission investment fund, that will be 406,000. So those grants we anticipate will continue to be funded. That's good news. Um, further questions, discussion? If not, um, I'll and move to approve two limited service positions at the Agency of Human Services funded by ongoing grants from the Corporation for National and Community Service, AmeriCorps. Second. 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 We have lots of them. I guess Senator Cummings said it first. I'll okay. see. Uh, further discussion? If not, Clark will call the Senator Baruch. Yes. Senator Cummings. Yes. Representative Harrison. Yes. Uh, Representative Lampert. Yes. Representative Shy. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Mm, can't yes. hear you. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Senator Sears says yes, I believe. Um, Senator Weston. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Senator Kitchell. Yes. And zero. Now we're on to um, request 3157, and it's 300,000 um, to the Agency of Agriculture, Food, and Markets from the Natural Resources uh, Conservation Service for one limited service position. Um, do we have anyone who wants to speak to this request here? Yes, on the screen. We have um, Mary Montour. Uh, was with um, the Agency of Agriculture. You want to speak sure. to the request? Good morning. Uh, so this is a request for a limited service position to support um, essentially a grazing technical assistance provider at our agency. And this position would be supporting direct assistance to farmers to enhance their grazing management practices and also in coordination with other part other external partners and it's being funded through a grant from the natural resource conservation service and uh, the way i like to look at the grant is the grant will be fully funding the position and then we'll be matching the grant with our current financial cost share programs. So we currently have grant programs for farmers to do these practices. And I'm here for any questions that people might have. Any questions? Not. Someone like to make a motion? Um, uh, I will move to approve $300,000 in one limited service position at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets to provide technical assistance to small farms to support grazing management systems funded by a grant from USDA and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Second. Our second from Senator Westman. There's no further discussion. The clerk will call the roll. Senator Baru. Yes. Senator Cummings. Yes. Representative Harrison. Yes. Representative Lampert. Yes. Representative Shai. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Senator Westman. Yes. 
Representative Wood? Yes. Representative Cornish? Yes. Senator Kitchell? Yes. 10 0. Thank you. Um, now we'll move on to what? Actually, we just need to go back to the original motion for the, on the PDG grant because it should be two positions at the health department, not one, to match up with the grant documentation. So we just want to go back to the original motion as written. Um, yeah. As, yes. okay. yep. Not the corrected one. Correct. Okay. All right. So I guess we will. Do we re vote this? This is three things. It's clear if you do. What? I think it's probably it's clear if you do. Okay. All right. So um, why don't we go back to um, grant 3155? And what we're doing is um, the motion as originally stated um, by Representative Wood, not the one that had the numbers corrected. Which is what we voted on. So we're going to go back and re vote the original motion um, that uh, was offered by Representative Wood. Do you want to restate it? Okay. Um, so I move to approve 14 limited service positions, seven at the Department for Children and Families, two at the Department of Health, one at the Department of Mental Health three at the Agency of Education, and one at the Office of Racial Equity. The positions are funded under a grant from the previously approved Preschool Development Grant, JFL number 2970. And the second, I believe, was um, Senator Cummings? Yeah. Okay. I'll some again. good seconds. Okay. So I, we have to re, uh, we have to revote Yes. I did this in pink, so <laughs> let me know now if I need to start a new sheet. <laughs> you ready? Yes, please come. Okay, me. Senator Baru. Yes. Senator Cummings. Yes. Representative Harrison. Yes. Representative Lamford. Yes. Representative Shy. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Senator Weston. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Senator Kitchell. Yes. And zero. Oh, thank you. Good job. All right. So now we're going to move on, and we have uh, one more, um, which is a position change request. And uh, this is something that was familiar um, when we did the child care bill and uh, the positions there. Um, there was language that allowed, if in fact the positions upon uh, final determination needed to be um, different than what we included in the bill that the Joint Fiscal Committee had the authority to uh, make the change and make the positions consistent with where um, the work and the um, and the positions titles um, to be um, updated based on the um, more information. So what we have is a request from the Department of Children and Families um, to um, change the titles of the positions uh, from what were included in the bill. So we need a motion to simply, it involves no more money, it's simply uh, truing up the uh, position titles with, um, with the work to be done. I have a question. Yes. Maybe um, AHS can answer it, but it seems like, and I don't know what these people do, um, not my area of the budget, but we're, we're taking a position that someone who actually does the licensing work and then adding a supervisor, is that? Um, there is a supervisor, but the supervisors also carry caseloads. So we will get an, ex an increase in the number of people being able to do the direct licensing work in addition to being able to spread out the supervision responsibilities. Okay, that's good. Um, Secondly, it looked like you're going to use existing funds within your budget for the match. The, no, these I'm positions sorry, the extra cost of the, it's a higher pay grade, mm -hmm. right? There was a sufficient appropriation for the administrative costs to include this, and there still is additional funds to support communications and IT. Okay, will this affect our budget next year? Now, these well? were all anticipated when we did the bill. They were. Okay, I'm fine. They're in the base. Yeah, they're in the base. And um, 
Um, actually, the funding is for even uh, a, a greater number than the 11 that were included in the bill. Well, it, there was funding for 11 and there was uh, communication and outreach um, that goes out to community partners um, within that $2 million. So, so um, yes, this was all anticipated. What we're doing is uh, making the positions match up. Um, and we have the authority to do that. So um, the request for us is to exercise that authority um, on these four positions. So I would uh, entertain a motion um, to, um, uh, to take this action. So Representative Wood, you want to make that motion? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I move to approve the replacement of four positions authorized in 2023 Act 76. Section seven, paren B, paren two, with alternate classifications as detailed in the Department for Children and Families memo dated July 27, 2023. A second to the motion, Senator Westman. Further discussion or questions? If not, clerk will call. Senator Brew. Yes. Senator Cummings. Yes. Representative Harrison. Yes. Representative Lamper. Yes. Representative Shai. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Senator Westman. Yes. Representative Wood. Yes. Representative Kornheiser. Yes. Senator Kitchell. Yes. And zero. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we are obviously um, a little behind schedule and our next um, um, item on the agenda is uh, the re, um, revenue forecast update. And we have Tom Quebec here, who's uh, the legislature's economist. Um, and we have included in the packet um, document um, that is uh, update. And this will be presented again at the um, e-board in, in about an hour. So. But I'm sure, given how late we're running, I'm curious how much time you want us to spend on this particular agenda. Well, I think the joint fiscal report is going to be very limited. So what I would like to do is um, 15 minutes, if we could. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and if there are questions that aren't answered in other arenas, um, I'm happy to field those afterwards individually uh, also. Uh, this isn't a seismic change in uh, revenues, in large part because the, the forecast of the fiscal 23 came in really close to target across all three funds. The miss was 1.2% and um, a little bit on the plus side, so $39 million more than had been expected, but on a base of $3.2 billion, that's about precision. What? That's pretty close to precision. Yeah, that's pretty good. And, and, you know, that's the hope is you sort of balance risks. Not everything happens within the subcategories exactly like you think, but that's, you know, that's what we try to do. So uh, also in the macroeconomic environment, not that much has, has changed. Um, I'd say the picture's a little bit better, but the same forces are at play. And if you just look at the uh, handout, the first three full page charts, which turn on page two, um, are sort of like what's what's happening. The first one's inflation, and you can see how it spiked up to 9% a year ago, uh, but it's come down steadily to 3%, which is a little bit better than I think what people thought might be possible, but it's a long way from over. Uh, but that's the problem. Uh, with the economy writ large. So the, what, what's being done to address it is the Federal Reserve is raising interest rates to slow the economy and try to check inflation. And uh, it, it would be a lot more helpful if fiscal policy was aligned with that same goal, but it's not. So everything's happening through interest rate increases, cost of capital, and sectors of the economy that are dependent on credit are really getting hammered, and that's where the slowing is starting. But third slide, the thing that's delaying that to some extent is the enormous wealth that's out there, the enormous spending uh, that's occurred by 
governments, mostly federal government, um, businesses and consumers. So um, I, that keeps chugging along. Job growth is, is chugging along at the national level uh, and uh, labor markets are still tight. Uh, consumers are still spending. Question is, is it possible to get lower inflation and still keep that train going? Or as has been the case through almost all of recent economic history, will the Fed have to get to the point where uh, it's, it's really uh, hitting employment, unemployment goes up, um, that there's something more akin to a classic recession? I don't think any economist is saying there's not going to be a slowdown of some kind. When you raise interest rates like this, you know, they've gone up five basis points in 15 months to the highest level in 22 years. I don't think anybody thinks that's not going to have any effect, but it's been blunted by the massive amounts of money that are out there and still being spent. And that's likely to keep inflation higher, but we'll see. Uh, you know, for for optimists, the data that came out in the last week was just phenomenal. You know, the, the personal consumption uh, expenditure price index, which is more what the Fed looks at than the consumer price index, which is what is kind of thought of as headline inflation. Uh, it, it dropped to three percent also, um, you know, and and their target is only two percent. So it's come from nine to three. You think, OK, a little bit more and we're done. But it will bounce around. There are a lot of things going on underneath it. Big decline in energy prices was a big part of that. There are charts and things like that in there that, that speak to that. Um, and so it's, um, uh, it's an open question. And, uh, but our outlook hasn't materially changed. Things are going to be much slower in the macro environment in fiscal 24 and 25. Uh, and then we're not looking at a, a big pop back either because a lot of these, a lot of the fiscal uh, support and stimulus will have <coughs> proceeded by that. But, uh, you know, that, that's the context for the revenue changes that are recommended. Um, they, they are, again, relatively small rel to, compared to the whole budget. But uh, for the most part, positive in the next two years, in all, all three of those funds, uh, somewhat positive. Uh, the biggest increase is in the general fund, which will be about $78 million higher than forecast in January. But remember, there, there is still a decline in total available general fund revenues in fiscal 24 that is projected. So it's just $78 million less than was expected in January. That is almost entirely due to interest income, which is something that we've never spent that much time analyzing. It's been all of zero to, well, maybe, yeah, no, almost zero uh, some years to maybe seven or eight million in a really good year. But the average over the last 45 years uh, up until uh, not including fiscal 23, has been about $3 million a year. So 45 years, that's about you know what you're getting from this. Uh, in, in fiscal 21, it was 0 0.9. Fiscal 22 was 2.6. Fiscal 23, 56.7. So you know this is, this is not a, a typical situation. There's a chart on page. 26, that is the average daily cash balances that the, that the treasurer's uh, looking at. And you can see, so this starts in 2004, chugs along, you know, 200, 300, 400, 500 million, you know, balances. There's some seasonality because you get an April spike with income tax payments and then it gets drawn down. But that's like, you know, every time we run this, we have to change the scale and add more room on the top because it's now uh, uh, over 2.3 billion. And, you know, there are periods it's going up to 2.5, 2.6 at times. Um, and this has happened at the same time that interest rates have gone up 
to levels that we haven't seen in 22 years. So the opportunity to make money with that is there. And the treasurer's office sort of, you know, has moved into this more and more aggressively and the returns they're getting are pretty solid. So not nothing high risk going on here. You're talking certificates of deposit and treasury notes and things like that. I mean, there's no, nobody stretching to get return, but they're getting more than 5%, even with a mix of some things that are one and 2% that are local area loans and things like that. Anyway, go ahead and ask a question. Yeah, I mean, so this is the interest money on the state's fund. Yeah, state okay. money, that, it's not um, all of it, it's just, they, they break it out by fund, general so, fund. So earlier, and I guess it's being re-diverted because of the flood, but the treasurer wanted to take some of those excess funds, 85 million or so, and, and use it for other purposes. Um, and now we're gonna use that money for, for flood relief. How is that going to impact this forecast, or is it not? It's up in the bucket, really. Yeah, two point three billion, and you look at the deployment of the, uh, you know, of the other funds. Yeah. My other question is, in terms of the general fund forecast, um, the last couple of months, the personal income uh, has been below target. Right. And is that likely to continue? Yes. Okay, and that's. We're still going to be ahead of the game because that's the big number. No, we're we're seeing. To be clear, we're going to, we're going to see a decline in between fiscal twenty three and fiscal twenty four yeah. in the available general fund, and and a big part of that is is personal income. Okay, but we're going to see seventy eight million dollars less of a decline than we had thought back in January, and that's largely because we're going to be getting. $79 million, well, uh, 69 of that will fall to the general fund. So $69 million in interest. And that's a fairly con conservative run on the assumptions that we're using for this. Now, that said, it's the first time we've had these data. We've gone through it, you know, we spent a lot of time with the treasurer and his staff uh, you know, looking at how they're deploying and looking at the timing, looking at when they expect to draw it down because they're a lot of it's about a billion of its federal funds that have expiration dates and all that kind of thing. So a lot of it gets spent between now and fiscal 26. But um, I, I feel like there's upside to this number too, but 69 more million dollars, uh, you know, is, well, we had forecast maybe 18, 16, something like that in the prior forecast. So a lot more money from interest. So that's that's one of the part of the 78. The other big part of it is corporate uh, income. Corporate income had been strong in fiscal 23. Um, and we took it apart at a very granular level with the tax department uh, over the past two months and looked at at uh, individual file, try, try to see the extent to which there's sort of a different floor because a bunch of things happened at the same time. The pandemic was at play. We moved though to market-based sourcing for the, the basis of the income tax. So it used to be, you know, you, you'd need employees and a presence in the state and, and buildings and property to really be the biggest potential payers. And of course, you need a profit on top of that. Because, it, But all those things would affect the state's uh, uh, take on that. So there were some very big employers that were hardly ever paying uh, an income tax because they didn't have a profit. But it was, you know, there could be bigger corporations outside that were selling to a lot of Vermonters that we weren't really getting much of anything. So the, the switch to market-based sourcing uh, appears to really have been a net positive. It's really substantially uh, positive. It's also broadened the, the, the base, the tax base for corporate. We did a run looking at fiscal 19 and fiscal 23. Um, in those two years, there were only 40% of the payers that paid in fiscal 19 showed up in fiscal 23. That's an enormous churn and shift in the tax base. And there, it, it's not as top heavy if you just look at the distributions. And a lot of entities that are huge corporations 
that sell into Vermont and are enormously profitable. Teeny little, you know, piece of that goes work, but it's a teeny little piece of an enormous level of profitability. Doesn't change their business behavior at all. No, none, none of those companies are saying, oh, because Vermont's now taxing us differently, we're gonna do something that, you know, hurts the people of Vermont. We're not gonna sell there. We're not gonna, you know, it's, it's, it's hardly noticed. Uh, and you see this also in the way some of the payments are made and then adjusted and all this kind of thing. So Tom, what I hear you yeah. saying is that yes, personal income is going yeah. down a little bit. We'll probably continue to go down. Our overall revenue is certainly going to go down from our peak during the pandemic with all the federal spending. But yeah. we're both rebasing higher than pre-pandemic. Yeah. The curve is at a new, better place. And we're making up for the personal income loss with some great increases in corporate and interest income. So overall, yeah. we're so, the picture is looking slightly better than it was before. Yeah, seventy-eight million dollars better than before, um, but in the same with corporate. Corporate, we still expect less from corporate. After doing this analysis, there are also some one-time events and things like that that you can identify. And um, in in a world where interest rates are higher, there's less in the way of corporate acquisitions, corporate mergers, things like that. A lot of that's debt financed. So um, when that gets to be harder. Um, we get big windfalls when those things happen sometimes. But we're still better off than pre-pandemic. Oh, yeah. We're way better off than pre-pandemic. Thank you. I think, yeah. I think Compared it's pre -pandemic, sometimes because we're so yeah. stuck in last year. Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we have a relative to last year. Um, okay, it's still dropping, but not by as much. And a relative to last January, which is the basis of the last forecast. Uh, and it's and it's better than that, slightly better. But um, anyway, the uh, changes in the other funds besides the the whoops, uh, the first page. Actually, I think the best revenue graph is not the first page, but uh, get the page page number twenty four, which goes which shows the whole five years which I think is, is a little bit more useful. By statute, we just forecast two years and it's, a, and, and it's only, the budget is only adopted for two years, but we provide this just by way of backdrop because it's not that hard to do. And we started doing it many years ago, uh, just gratis and we keep it up. But anyway, it's useful because there are some things that are short term and more and more there are events that are longer term that are important to understand and plan for. Um, but if you look at the other funds, the transportation fund had the fee bill increases from the last session. Fee bill that would really uh, yeah, it would been, yeah, it would have been yeah. Well, it was ugly before, which is part of why there's a fee bill. Yeah, the tax base is not growing quickly for most transportation categories. Good thing we have that fee bill. It is a good thing yes. we did. Uh, yeah, well, that's an inflation adjustment. If you don't adjust for inflation you know, and your base isn't growing very much, you're gonna to have to get the money somewhere or cut back on, on what you spend. But but yeah, so so that phases in, there's a little bit in 24 and then, you know, stays there. But again, it doesn't grow a lot because it's based, you know, on numerical counts that are demographic and a little bit economic. But anyway, um, and the education fund does a little bit better because it's, uh, anchored by the big consumption taxes, which are not as cyclical as things like personal income and corporate and all that. It doesn't go up as much when things go up, but it doesn't go down as much when things go down. And it gets about $9 million in interest next year and seven, five, whatever, you know, on down through through the forecast period. So, um, so the education fund is a little bit better also. So that's things in a nutshell. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Eve, there is a, a chart in here on um, employment, unemployment, um, but, and demographics on, and wages. Obviously, workforce shortages are driving wages up. I mean, that's, yeah. you know, when there are shortages, you're going to pay more. And um, it just seems like our workforce size and because of demographics and retirements, we're going to be seeing a lot of competition 
and for workers, mm -hmm. and that'll drive wages up, which in turn contributes to inflation. I'm just thinking about just um, what those workforce dynamics are going to be um, out into the future and um, how those um, factors are all sort of interrelated. Yeah, well, that's the trillion dollar question because that's what the Fed's asking. Yeah. They're trying to discern. You know, they, they didn't they, pay me to ask that question. Okay, well, maybe you should, if, if, if there's an answer, that might be worth something. Yeah. But anyway, um, I'll answer the best I can, which is just to say, uh, there are a lot of people that don't think until the labor markets, until the tightness is loosened a bit, that really inflation is going to come down. There are more and more organized work actions, too, that you see and hear about. But there's definitely upward pressure because supply and demand is dictating that. Um, you know, but expectations are not stratospheric. So, you know, when you look at, at, at what the expectations are, um, they're, they're still anchored fairly low at fairly low uh, uh, rates, but labor costs are lagging. Uh, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a one year review or sometimes a multi year contract that somebody has um, and and they don't they don't respond immediately like prices can go up to, when costs do you can raise price right away. But the labor cost doesn't usually go up and up or down like that. And so I think there's going to be pressure for that coming in. One thing I didn't mention was the flood, you know, and so there's a section here on the flood. Um, we finished the macroeconomic forecast about a week before the flood hit. And um, in order to do analysis that would incorporate that, uh, we would need a lot of detail. That's why I was interested in the in the discussion before uh, on the on the on the losses and what kinds of losses and where they are and which losses are not covered by you know insurance public or private and um, I, we would need a lot more information to do that we've we've done these kinds of analyses before it's a whole field in economic disaster economics um, and there's more and more business in that area but We've done work for the Army Corps of Engineers in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, and for the Bureau of the Interior in Colorado with wildfires. And it, it's often the results are not intuitive when you say, how is this going to affect the economy of the state? It depends on how much outside money is available to come in for remediation. It depends over what time frame you look at, and it depends on a lot of very discrete characteristics about the event. So it is not, though, a no-brainer that because there's a lot of loss, that that primarily hits wealth first. So property that's owned as wealth is damaged and out of use. The flows, though, are what determine most revenue categories that we're analyzing. The flows like income, employment, GDP, uh, uh, those sorts of flows, when juiced by a lot of outside money coming in, just like with the pandemic, that's a disaster example, where you can end up with greater flows than you had before because of all this money and the fact that you're not paying, but it's not your money that's used in 1927 most of the 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 money that was used for remediation came in the state there was a little bit of federal money but nothing like this it took a decade or so to deal with back even further in 1821 there was a big flood in the southern part of the state and th there were whole communities that just disappeared you know the the records would just say pretty much everybody just up and left you get that kind of behavior, you're gonna have a big economic response, but that's not likely to be what's happening here. You could tell from the conversation. So it's not a slam dunk that, oh, we should lower the forecast because of that. It certainly could affect some of the timing. Um, and if, as we get more data and information, we can circle back and maybe do some runs on that. But right now, it's, it's not a part of it, and it's not like I would say automatically, oh, we should lower it or raise it or something.
I think on that note, we're going to have some lunch before you go to the keyboard. <laughs> That's fine. I hope you guys have time. As well. And now we have poor Catherine. I'm, I'm, I'm be fast. <laughs> so we'll see you. Um, yes, I, you all have received the, the uh, Catherine Ben, Chief Fiscal Officer of the Fiscal Office. You all have received the Fiscal Office's report. You've heard a lot of it today. Already. There's actually some nice summaries of some of the key revenues how they compare, what next they drop them down from your forecast to the individual ones. There's other, other updates in the closeouts in the education fund. Uh, Um, I would, um, we're doing some stuff with the, uh, the renewable energy summer study is moving ahead and we signed contracts so we've, and we're doing that on other summer studies that are moving forward. I want to draw your attention to that we have two we're recruiting positions um, in our office, one for the Senate Appropriations Committee and some of you may or may not know Dan Dickerson has gone to be, I forget his title, is it that, that ACC? ACC. Um, it's, He's the director of finance and administration, something in ACCD. So he, we have an agreement where he, he is still continuing to do some work for us and probably uh, replacement. But if you know of anybody who's interested or a good fit, the links are on the end of your fiscal note. And I think I'm gonna, I don't know if anybody has any questions about anything, and I feel like you all probably need to. We have had no break since <laughs> nine o'clock this morning. So uh, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, you're um, so um, I believe the chair has the authority to adjourn the meeting. And so that is exactly what I'm going to do. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>